Friday, Lance Russell and Dave Brown right along ringside. By golly, we're about ready to go with more big action. Thank you very much, and welcome to Georgia Championship Wrestling. I'm Gordon Soley, your host, and we have quite an hour in store for us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Championship Wrestling at ringside. This is Vince McMahon, along with wrestling's only living legend, Bruno Sammartino. Welcome to this week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling Television. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, another outstanding card. Hey, guys, and welcome back to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. That's right, guys, guaranteed 100% territory talk each and every time out here on the show. And I'm your host, a slightly under the weather, Ray Russell. So I apologize for the voice here this week, guys. I think it's just an allergy deal. Can't seem to shake it just yet. The fall season gets me nearly every time, and it didn't escape me here this year in 2023. But I'm powering right through it. Going to try to do another show here this week. Not going to leave you guys hanging any longer. Lots of shows coming here in the upcoming weeks. More 1986 UWF with Roman Gomez. But this week, it's back to 1981 and the vacationing Jamie Ward. Going to stop by. Going to add his expertise back to more Georgia Championship Wrestling. And I can't wait for that. But before we get there, just a reminder, you guys can listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast and our sister shows like Monday Warfare, The Battles Within, all about the Monday Night War, currently in the summer months of 1996, the formation of the NWO. Also, you can listen to the Wrestling Memory Grenade, the granddaddy of them all here at the WrestleCopia brand, currently in the month of November of 1987, getting ready to discuss the inaugural Survivor Series, all the way back in 1987 at the Richfield Coliseum. And of course, our upcoming podcast, ready to launch in just a week or two, it's the Wrestling Stoop with wrestling legend Bob Roop. Going to share his stories and memories from throughout his 20-plus years in the professional wrestling business, both in the ring as well as behind the scenes. Going to share stories not only about himself, but he's also got tons of never-heard-before stories involving many of the legends of professional wrestling. Looking forward to that one. And we got another show that I can't quite announce yet here, but just know there's another program as well coming soon, all part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. You can listen to it over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Google, and beyond. And be sure to follow me on social media, guys, for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. I'm also constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history all across my social media, including X. You can follow me on Twitter at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And of course, while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And lastly, before we get to the program, just going to ask everyone who wants to support that next up-and-coming wrestling podcast brand, trying to put as much quality product as I can out there into the wrestling fandom world, so I'm asking you guys to give it a try. I'm talking about that $5 all-access tier over at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. And you may be asking, what does that $5 tier get me, Ray? Well, I'm about to tell you guys. It gets you all of my insanely detailed book-like show notes, pages upon pages of show notes for every episode of the Wrestling Memory Grenade, Monday Warfare, and of course, Regional Wrestling as well. You also get early access to many of the podcasts here on WrestleCopia, where you can listen days and sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners. You also get remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade Show, covering the 1989 NWA project. Includes enhanced sound quality and new content and conversations that were originally edited out of the initial broadcast due to time restraints, now edited back into the shows. But that's not all, guys. You also get digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. Just drop 10 new digital downloads in the last week or so. And of course, you'll also get the Patreon-exclusive Watch Along series, covering many past WWF and WCW pay-per-views, Coliseum videos, Saturday Night's main events, Clash of the Champions, and so much more. Plus, random bonus video drops. Again, two or three of those just added in the last week. So lots of goodies there, and you get all of it for the low, low price of just $5. And there's no subscription, cancel any time. 
Show your support. Give it a try for a month. I think you'll like all of the content that I offer. And every penny of it goes right back here into paying the bills and keeping the WrestleCopia Podcast Network up and running for the months and the years to come. And now with all of that said, all of that out of the way, it's time to jump back into the Regional Wrestling Podcast this week for more Georgia Championship Wrestling 1981. All right, again, before we start the show, I apologize to the listeners out there. Not going to be my best episode ever, at least from my end. That's why I'm bringing Jamie Ward back here on the show in just a minute. Hopefully, he'll elevate me, boost me into making this another very enjoyable episode. And that said, I finally found him after a lengthy vacation. Hope you've been enjoying yourself. Jamie Ward, welcome back to the show, man. Glad I finally found you, man. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a long while. I'm back from my um, whirlwind tour. Yeah, I'd say some people take a hiatus. You took a high ninus, man. You were on vacation forever. I was up and down the East Coast since uh, like August 18th. And uh, I only worked three out of 31 days and I got back and now I'm hurt again. And uh, But we're we're ready to rock and roll. And let's get back to some Georgia Championship Wrestling. Make everybody happy today. Uh, I was going to say, do you got one of those uh, Lloyds of London gimmicks going? That would have been a great idea. Made, made a lot of those uh, Minnesota boys a whole lot of money back in the day. Oh, it sure uh, did. That was the end of Lloyd's of London and professional wrestling because it's fake, right? You can't get hurt. Come on, guys. No, not at all. So last we talked to each other, Jamie, I don't know if you can remember that far back at your age, but it was Tommy Rich winning the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, of course, losing it just a few days later back to the champion, Harley Race at this point in time, now a six times NWA World Champion. So Looking forward to seeing where we go with that NWA world title and where we go with Tommy Rich as we move on into the month of May. Yeah, and you can't ignore that Thunderbolt Patterson won the IWL World Heavyweight Championship from the Sheik. Only for the Sheik to steal it from him in the uh, locker room, I believe the story was. And we'll see how long the IWL kicks around. I think it was for a couple of months. But eh, like I said, guys, there's a little bit of the footage out there. I believe a whole episode at least out there on YouTube. So look it up. That was a fun time discussing one of the... Uh, outlaw promotions of yesteryear uh, absolutely and if anybody has a uh, needs a cure for insomnia make sure you watch that show and i got a long list of little outlaw mud shows as jim Cornette would call them from the 70s and early 80s a list of territory well i'm calling them a territory but any, everything from diamond belt to sun belt and on down the line i'd love to dress some of those in time as i get a little more research in on those but for now guys it's back to the big leagues the NWA and uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling as we move on. Going to look at some results here as we head into the following week of television. Looking now at, oh, I should have, I should mention, guys, before we get rolling, I apologize at the top of the show for my current situation here, my uh, my health situation, my allergies. Jamie, I'm sorry you have to put up with listening to my voice. Uh, your voice is always golden. You can't bother me anyway. Uh-uh, brother. So we will begin here May the 4th, Augusta, Georgia, at the Bell Auditorium. That's the William Bell Auditorium, guys, promoted by Charlie Harbin. Harbin, born in Georgia, wrestled there from the 1930s to the 1960s, became a referee, then a ring announcer in the early 1970s, and finally, the promoter here in Augusta. How about that, Jamie? He liked to stay local, didn't want to travel, but it's a uh, hometown success story. It is indeed, and he's been there basically forever in the wrestling business. As uh, we see the show begin here, it's Roberto Soto over the French Angel, Frank Morell, Bob Eaton over Tommy Wright, Robert Gibson defeating the Mongolian Stomper, so you know what that means, Stomper on his way out of the territory. Also on the card, it's Wildfire, Tommy Rich over Nikolai Volkov, and in the main event, we're in Augusta, one of the Oates brothers coming down, it's Ted DiBiase and Jerry Oates battling the Freebirds to a double disqualification. You can never go wrong with uh, an Oates in Georgia. No, you can't. You got an Oates brother. Not both of them on the card, but Jerry Oates brought in. I was uh, Ted was more fundamentally sound, but I think Jerry was the more total package if there was such a thing between the two Oates brothers. Jerry had the uh, the lankier body. Yeah, a little taller, absolutely. And yeah, he just uh, fit the part a little better. I think he was one of the convertible blondes there 
in Georgia with Rip Rogers when uh, Ole had to uh, combat the uh, the WWF in 1984. That was Ted. Oh, was it Ted? Okay, all right. Yes, I stand corrected. Short, I haven't seen it in years. One, because they actually, I believe, did an Oats for Oats feud there real quick. Oh, you're right. They had the two. Sure, that time. That's right. Okay. But, but I'm pretty sure it was Ted. Okay. Well, I will uh, I will go along with that because you, your memory of George is probably a little better than mine. Uh, as we go on, there was a show on May the 5th in Dublin, Georgia, but no results for that. So we continue with May the 6th, Columbus, Georgia. Now we're in Oates territory at the Memorial Auditorium. It's Robert Gibson over French Angel, Roberto Soto defeating Bobby Eaton, Ted Oates over Gypsy Joe, the Fabulous Freebirds defeating the team of Jerry Oates and Ted DiBiase on a disqualification, and in the main event that night, Wildfire Tommy Rich again defeating Nikolai Volkov. Got a couple other shows that week as well, May the 7th in Roswell, Georgia, and May the 8th in Talladega, Alabama. wonder if Bob Holly showed up for that one. Both dates announced by Freddie Miller on May the 2nd TV. Now, I don't have results for those. I'd love to find them. They're not really out there anywhere that I could find anyway. But I just like mentioning some of these smaller towns and when they go outside of Georgia, even if I don't have the results, to kind of give you guys an idea of everywhere they were going. Yeah, when I heard that on the second show, that kind of caught me by surprise because I feared that was fuller territory. Yeah, that's not the first time they've went into Alabama. I'm not really sure without looking at the geography of the state where Talladega is in that state. But uh, yeah, it's curious how they were working a few cities over there. But when they would pop in over there, I'd see in the results, sometimes you would see a fuller. But now that they've kind of been ousted from the territory, I wonder how well they're getting along. Well, they're going to wind up coming back. So, you know, wrestling is whatever uh, gets you through to make a buck. Well, you got that right. As we roll on to May the 9th in Atlanta at WTBS Studios, going to watch a couple hours of television here, and it all kicks off with Ted DiBiase scoring a win over the Mighty Yankee. Also on the card, Ricky Gibson over Bobby Garrett. And then what is this? Out of nowhere, it's Bruiser Brody. So next here on the Georgia Championship Wrestling. <laughs> Guess who? Tell me, guess who? I know who you are. Yeah, you ought to know. Let me tell you something. I don't want to get personal with you or nobody else for that matter. But don't shuffle me as another name on championship wrestling. You know, when I came in the country from overseas last week, I was passing through Los Angeles and saw the show on TV. Gordon Soley telling everybody how big Bruiser Brody is. Everybody who knows anything about professional wrestling knows how big I am. You don't need to tell them how big, what kind of wrestler I am. What they want to know and what you want to know is what I can do in the ring. If what they heard about what I do in the ring is true, don't give them the gaga about he's another big goose, 300 pounds in the wrestling business. Don't give them the gaga about what a good wrestler I am because none of that matters. You get down to the guts of the situation and tell them exactly what I do in the ring. That way, I'm going to get along with you. I'm going to get along with everybody. The wrestlers, the promoters, the fans, and mostly you. Yeah, well, all right, I'll tell you what, uh, Mr. Brody, we have a match scheduled. Big Jim Duggan is scheduled to wrestle right now, and if you don't mind, we'll just uh, uh, turn it over to our ring announcer. And much like most of his career, Bruiser Brody's showing up whenever he wants, wherever he wants, and he says he's not just here. He doesn't want to be put over as a big man, another big goof. People can see how big he is, Jamie. Let's talk about what kind of wrestler he is, what he's all about. And I like that approach. Brody basically saying, I don't want to be sold as just another big guy coming to town. I'm something special. And that's what's great about this interview. You know my love for Michael Hayes. Now you're about to find out my love for Bruiser Brody. His interviews on this Georgia show today and when he comes back here and there are like the highlight of the show. The guy just has so much energy and excitement in his voice. Even though he's a heel, he's a heel that you can like. Yeah, it's controlled chaos. We know he's coming out, or at least they know he's coming out, but it doesn't feel that way as a fan. Gordon Sully selling it awesome out there as well, like, oh, no, not this guy. And Brody just shows up out of the blue, it would seem. And wouldn't you know it, he's standing there ringside as we head back to the ring for our next matchup. It's his good buddy, Jim Duggan, ready to take on Pat Rose. But it is Pat Rose who will score the win over Big Jim Duggan by disqualification. After interference from Bruiser Brody almost right away straight out of the gate, 
Brody, he's not waiting to have a match here on TV. He's getting the job done right now. Yeah, Brody's not fooling around. I loved it when he just went in there and just started wailing away on Pat Rose. And Duggan didn't care. No, As you it, can tell, Brody probably, hey, Duggan growing up, probably got to see Brody in the WWF around 76 and 77. And it's probably like a hero of his. He wasn't going to argue about Brody getting involved in his match. No, absolutely not. And, of course, they used Jim Duggan to Glenn put Brody Haven, over last week. What's that? Glen Haven, New York. That's Glens Falls. Glens Falls. Glens Falls. There you go. Where am I getting to Haven? Anyway, Glens Falls. Well, there's Havens. There's Havens. You've been everywhere lately, Jamie. You've got all kinds of cities going through your mind. Oh, yeah. It's, at least I'm home now. So, nevertheless, it is Pat Rose scoring a win here on TV over Jim Duggan by DQ after that outside interference from Bruiser Brody, who gives no fucks. Sorry, guys. I cursed. And uh, here we go. We're going to go back to Gordon Soley once more. It's more Bruiser Brody. What? Better right now than I did a couple minutes ago when I was out here. You know, a lot of guys can come out here week after week, and they can shoot their big mouths off. And I'll probably be the biggest offender there's ever been. Because I got a great big yapper that nobody's been able to close. I told you. And I told everybody who watches this show, I don't care whether it's on the East Coast or the West Coast. I came here for a reason. Don't think I'm looking for work. I'm not. I came here because I was asked. I was asked personally to come here. And don't mistake me. I wasn't asked to come here for money. Because what I'm going to do here, I don't want paid for. I come here on a personal favor for a very, very personal friend of mine. And what's going to happen? Go ahead, go ahead, butt in. Well, I know I'm we're going to have a lot of conflict. Well, I'm just a little But I'm going to make it clear. This is a beginning. Don't say I've never seen nothing like it, because you're going to see a lot more of it. Well. A lot of wrestlers, they come out here, they do a lot of talking, Jamie. And Brody, he's probably near the top of that list, but he backs it up. Brody says he doesn't need the work here. He came because he was personally asked to show up here in Georgia Championship Wrestling. So it was never about the money. It's a personal favor for a friend. And he says this is not the end, but only the beginning. But who is that friend, Jamie? And what is the favor? And I'm wondering the same exact thing. I'm drawing a blank going forward. So I'm going to enjoy this ride with Bruiser Brody while he's here. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's going to be a payoff to this or not, because we know how Brody would just leave town abruptly. So we'll have to just wait and see, guys. I don't watch too far ahead. I don't have everything memorized from watching it in the past. So just the same as you, Jamie, I'm a little eager yeah. to see where we go, but I kind of feel this might be one of those letdowns at, at the end of the day. I feel like maybe there's no payoff. So keep your uh, expectations tempered, everybody. Yeah, he's in and out until August, early September. He's right. not on every Omni card. He's not on every TV but he makes enough appearances that you don't forget about him. Then from there, it's back to the ring for the return, just in time for that Georgia heavyweight title tournament. It's Iron Mike Sharp back in Georgia here, scoring a win over Buck Brannigan. And then we're off to a very rarity here, a Iron Mike Sharp promo. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been gone approximately nine, ten months, and I'm uh, I just arrived back, and I'm really enjoying the uh, nice weather down here. I uh, just arrived back from Canada, and uh, I was wrestling up there, plus I was doing some extensive wrestling throughout Europe and Japan, and I'm looking, looking really forward to getting in the ring here and meeting some of the top competition. I understand you have some real top men here, and of course that's the name of the game in professional wrestling is competition, and I'm going all out to go right to the top. I know, I mentioned earlier during your match, of course, that you are an exponent of the pile driver, but not the form uh, of a pile driver that a Terry Gordy delivers as an example that is designed to jam the neck and injure a man. I know that you do it just, just enough to stun a man to take a victory. That's right. That's all I'm interested in is securing a victory. I'm not out to injure a man or hurt a man. I never have done the, anything intentionally to hurt my opponent, to put him out of action, to cripple him. But I understand this fellow, this Terry Gordy, who is part of the Freebirds, I understand. He is uh, a sadistic individual, and he goes all out to you cripple and injure his opponent. I don't agree with this type of philosophy, but I'll tell you one thing. If I ever get in the ring with him, he's the one that's going to get hurt, not me. Fair enough. Iron Mike Sharp, thank you so very much. So Sharp back in town after nearly a year, 
And then they talk kind of weird here, Gordon Sully talking about the pile driver hold, something that Sharp uses sometimes. I don't really recall that off the top of my head, but he doesn't use it here. But Gordon talking about how when Sharp does it, he does it just to jolt the man enough to win the match, not to injure him like that dastardly Terry Gordy. I liked where Gordon was going with this, but it's still a little hokey to me. Like, how do you know exactly the amount of pressure to apply on a pile driver in order not to cripple a guy? But basically the story here is you can do the move without trying to break a man's neck, something the Freebirds try to do each and every time. That's debatable. Debatable. It's it's debatable. The Freebirds are never out to hurt anybody. They just try to stun the guy to get the one, two, three. Michael Uh, Hayes has told you that in the past. They don't hurt anybody. They don't break the rules. They just do what they have to do to defend themselves. Have you been listening to the Michael Hayes promos I've been listening to? He talks about getting dirty and nasty and and planning terrible things. They're up all night with their cocaine and their their sex, drugs, and rock and roll. and, And they can't wait to blind the dog and break Ted DiBiase's neck and Poor old Uncle Elmer, who could forget about that? So, I mean, I don't know, Jamie. I don't know. You sound a little biased there. Deep down, you know Michael Hayes is a good guy. And we're going to find out just how good he is eventually. Uh, We'll wait and see. We'll see where where we go with that uh, in the uh, weeks to come. As we head back to the ring, it's Wildfire Tommy Rich taking on Jim Tucker, another outlaw guy from the local territories there in the Carolinas. Tommy Rich scoring the win here with the Fez Press. And then afterwards, Gordon Soley throws us to a VTR with the once again NWA world champion. Here's Harley Race. The 57-day wonder, the man that they said couldn't do anything, has finally done it all. There's not a human being that's ever put up paratites on anywhere in the world, alive in the world, that can say that he's helped the world's heavyweight title more times than Harley Ray, six times world's heavyweight champion. And buddy, I'm not done yet. At 38 years old, there's still many and many and many a mile left, many a record for me to set all on my own. But Tommy Rich, I wanna give credit where credit is absolutely due. You're a man among men. Seven days ago, you did not have to, or nor could you have been forced into it, had given me the opportunity of winning this back. But you were that kind of a man, the man that I have been all my life, regardless of whoever else may have comments in another direction. And I'm going to give you your just due. You can have that return any time you want it, buddy. Any time you want it, come after it because you're talking the living legend above, above all. Right here, right now, the world's heavyweight champion, six times around. Can you imagine how many years it's going to be before there's another human being that's capable of breaking a record like that? I am truly the wrestler's wrestler. It says it right on the top of the buckle. World's heavyweight champion. And there it is. Harley Race has done it all. Nobody has held the NWA world title more than Harley Six times now the champion, and he says he's not done yet. What do you think he means by that, Jimmy? He's not done yet. He's already world champion. What more can you do? Is he planning to lose it again so he could win it again? That sure is what it sounds like. He knows he's going to lose again. You think Harley would be a little more positive. Nobody will ever take this from around my waist again and concentrate more on the total amount of time like they do nowadays. Somebody's been champion such and such amount of days you'd think he would have been pushing for something like that at the time. Yeah, and he doesn't realize the world of professional wrestling is really changing. He's wondering who can get this job done and how long will it take them to acquire six world title reigns in about a decade's time. We'll find out. It'll be Ric Flair. But uh, I just found it funny here. Race referencing himself as being 38 years old, and I know that's accurate when I do some math in my head, but when you watch it, when you look at him, man, that's a rough 38. He's looked 50 since he was like 20. I was going to say, when I first got to see him on TBS, or even in the magazine, I should say when I first saw him in the WWF, I thought he was already 50 years old. 
Yeah, it's so weird to hear Harley refer to himself as 38, even though that's accurate, guys, here in 1981. Which means he's only about, as you're um, on the grenade, the episodes, he's only, what, 43, 44 later in the 80s? So, yeah, yeah, something, that, yeah, just into his 40s, which, I mean, what And a, I mean, he looked a lot older then. He looked like he was pushing 60. He did. He did indeed. It's, it's crazy. But uh, it's Harley Race, man, and he gets the job done each and every time out, no matter where he worked or what era. Yeah, he slowed down a little when he got to Vince, but I, I, I think he still made it work. And he had some fun matches with Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I mean, you still thought, maybe not for someone who was a hardcore, quote, smart fan at the time, you knew Harley wasn't beating Hogan. But if you were just, you know, one of those fans that knew the NWA, knew the WWF, and you didn't look too deep into things, you might have thought Harley had a chance of taking the belt from Hogan, even though Vince never pub- really publicized that much on his TVs. He, he did a little bit when he first came in, but after that, and once they gave him the king, he was never mentioned as a former world champion again. Right. Well, I mean, nevertheless, we're back here in 1981. Good old 81. So Harley Race is going to hold on to the belt for just a little while longer anyway. How long? We'll find out pretty soon, actually. But Harley here in the promo, he's giving credit to Tommy Rich for not only beating race for the belt, but being a real champion, a real man who gave race his return match almost right away, less than a week later. And race agrees in return to give Tommy a return match whenever he wants it. So we hear from one side of the recent title switches. We heard from the King or excuse me, the future King, the handsome Harley race here in the NWA. And now we're going to hear from the other side, the former NWA world champion. I can say former now it's been a week removed. I'm talking about the wildfire, Tommy Rich. A couple of very, very important facets uh, for the matches at the, uh, at the Omni on the 17th. The Georgia Heavyweight the Championship Round Robin Tournament. There must be a winner. A new champion will be crowned. And Tommy Rich is uh, one of the uh, contestants in that. And a $10,000 bounty has been put on you by the Freebirds. You know, by the Freebirds. You know, that's exactly right, Gordon. First of all, we're starting in Chattanooga tonight. And I'm starting against the Freebirds. Hayes, I've told you once. I've told you a hundred times, brother. If you had the guts and you was a man, you wouldn't put a bounty out. You're so big and bad, you run that mouth. You'd get in the ring. You know, right in this army, the biggest thing that's ever happened, just like Harley Race said, I am the number one contender. But to prove it, Gordon, to prove it, I need the Georgia strap. They've got the big tournament, $5,000, and Hayes has got $10,000 bounty. It wasn't nothing to me more than to see Mr. Hayes, Mr. Sissy, Mr. whatever he is. You know, wouldn't nothing tickle me more than to cost him some money. You know, and Gordon, I'm going to have to watch them all. $10,000 is a lot of money, you know, and uh, sometimes money speak louder than words. So, you know, it might be some folks in there trying to get me, you know, that, that I wouldn't even think would do it. But Bruiser Brody, I've seen him out here. You're talking about a nut or a wild man. I don't know what the guy is, but, you know, he's definitely tough. I've seen him go, and I'm not taking nothing away from him. But just like I said, Gordon, I've got to be on my toes all the time. And that's exactly where I plan on being. You know, because just like I said, the people in Georgia, the people all over the country, they've got behind Tommy Rich. They pushed me to the top. And, you know, I ain't going to let them down. I've had a knee. I've been hurt. I was off five to six weeks. And I ain't getting hurt no more, Hayes. I come back to Georgia to stay, brother. The Omni, the Georgia Bell, $5,000. The Omni, I'm coming, Hayes. And I'm going to get your money too, brother. Tommy Rich says if Michael Hayes was such a bad man, he'd fight Tommy himself. Well, that makes sense, Jamie. I'm sure you didn't want to hear that. Instead of putting that $10,000 bounty on the wildfire, including in the upcoming Georgia heavyweight title tournament. Tommy a little bit worried here. He says sometimes money speaks louder than words. Of course, a lot of guys may be gunning to put Rich out for that 10 grand. They've even teased Dusty Rhodes coming after that bounty. And Tommy says he's going to have to keep his mind on the swivel as he knows not only will people be coming after him, but he also has to focus on winning that Georgia heavyweight title. Yeah, and this is the next, I guess the ultimate step was for Tommy to get the NWA belt. But now we're taking another step where now everybody, even though he doesn't have the belt, everybody wants a piece of Tommy Rich just because there's a bounty on his head. And Michael Hayes is not afraid of Tommy Rich. Let's get this out of the way right now. All right. You know, he's trying to get off the coke habit. So he'd rather spend his money on other wrestlers than spend it on the Coke. Give it to Nikolai Volkov so he can go buy more Russian war bonds that he talks about all the way into the late 80s. 
that's a very possible thing. I mean, Michael was a big supporter of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. So you're telling me that he would fund a foreign country's financials to maybe purchase some illegal weaponry? I don't know. It sounds a little shady to me. But I won't get into that, guys. I don't need the wrong people come knocking on my door. We'll continue on with the show instead, Jamie. And it's uh, Brian St. John up in the uh, area now. Brian St. John scoring a win here over Tommy Wright with a high-angle belly-to-belly suplex. Really good. Brian St. John scoring the win. Four minutes time. Do you have any opinions, thoughts on the uh, short-lived career of one Brian St. John? Well, I enjoyed the team of him and Stan Lane. I had seen some stuff from Florida. Florida, right. And Brian and Stan were in Georgia just about a year ago at this time. Yeah, I was doing a, some tag I, team action. So, I, but this is the first time I've seen him on his own, and he's right where he, he belongs. The middle card kind of guy. I think he has a decent look for for what that was, but it was his wrestling that really impressed me. I I wonder what went wrong, why he didn't do a little more in the business. Not saying he was ever going to be a main event or anything like that. I did enjoy stuff with Stan Lane that that's out there. Didn't get to see that when it you know the original run, but I did. You know, lots of tapes and things have been traded over the years, and I've seen some of that. And I liked him with the team and Stan Lane, but this was really my first outing paying attention to him as a singles wrestler. And uh, I was honestly impressed. I, he was a little better than I remembered. So I question, why didn't they try to give this guy a little more? But I don't know. We'll see what happens with St. John as the weeks progress here in Georgia. Right now, though, we're interrupted for the third time on the show from Bruiser Brody. Your integrity is at stake solely. Well, Mr. Brody, if you wish to speak to me, if you'll move over to this side, I'll be more than happy to uh, carry on a discussion with you at this point in time, but I would prefer a I'm little calmness. Pick me apart. I'm not going to yell at you, and I'm not going to yell at nobody looking at me. Pick me apart. You got something you want to know about me? No, sir. It wasn't a particular situation of anything that I wanted to know about you. I think I know quite enough about you. Uh, we saw you in action last week here on television, and I think that uh, certainly spoke for itself. No, 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 no. You know, I saw that film, too, that you're talking about. I made the darn thing. I know what was on the film. You know what was on the film. Obviously, the promotion here knows what was on the film. The only people that don't know what was on that film is you. You didn't get to see it. Why? Why was the film cut? Why doesn't everybody get the same opportunity you got and I got? Well, first of all, Tell sir, him. there was a certain amount of, of scrupulous editing that had no, to be no, done. No, 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 no. Let's no, take, no, just no, take no, a look no. at it. Let's go back and take a look at it Put again the there. Put the film on. Put all the right. film on. I mean, an eye when it swells about the size of a beach ball. I mean, I know they understand. So Brody, talking about the editing of his match last week, remember they showed that match from St. Louis at the Chase Brody dominating his opponent there, and they did chop it up. We didn't see the whole matchup. Brody a little upset about that, demanding his VTR from St. Louis to be aired again while he commentates over it there, and I edited that part out. But Brody says, too many pretty boys running around here in Georgia. He says it's more follies than wrestling. Sounds like nowadays. But he says he's here to show people a real wrestler, and you don't get much more real looking than Bruiser Brody. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, when Brody comes out for this interview, notice he goes behind Gordon at first, and Gordon is not happy with that. And I believe that was a shoot look on Gordon's face. He doesn't want guys behind him. He wants guys right next to him. He wasn't too pleased there. You could, you could just tell. As, yeah. I believe uh, Gordon like motions him, makes him come forward instead of being behind him. Yeah, Gordon was very particular uh, about certain things, things people would say or do or out there in uh, – he was very uneasy whenever a guy would kind of go what you would, I guess you could call it off script, so to speak, as far as not not saying they had a script per se, but just that, you know, wait a minute, you're not standing here and talking into the microphone. You're kind of doing something behind me. And I don't like that. Yeah. Gordon wanted to be in charge. There you go. That's a, that's a good way to put it. And lots more about Gordon Soley coming soon to the Wrestling Stoop podcast with Bob Roop. He's got a million Gordon Soley stories. I can't wait for him to share those with the world. I know I'll be listening. So we go on with the show, and there's not a lot of this episode out there, guys. Not in my uh, tapes, all of the tapes I dug through, sorted through to find the uh, footage that I could for 1981 in Georgia Championship Wrestling. And really couldn't find a whole lot of this on YouTube either, Jamie. And I know that's where you watched it as well, this episode. So uh, we're already out of promos as far as uh, things go this week as we head into that big Omni card next weekend. But 
There are several matches still left here on the program, including national tag team champions, the Freebirds, that's Gordy and Roberts over Tommy Wright and Mike Stevens. Also, Iron Mike Sharp back out for a second time, scoring a win over the future Man Mountain. I'm talking about Rick Link. How do you think that match went? Mike Sharp over Rick Link. Barn burner? Oh, a real barn burner. Would have been impressive if he got Link up to slam him. But a little useless knowledge here. Uh, Rick Link was a subscriber to my newsletter back in the late 80s. Oh, very cool. Yeah, he's all over the social media. I see him on Facebook all the time as well. Rick Link's still out there alive and kicking. Also here this week on TV, Ted DiBiase. He's back, guys. DiBiase scoring another win, this time over Buck Brannigan. And in the final match of the evening, the Gibson brothers going to come out. Team up here. It's Ricky and Robert. That's the Gibsons, not the Rock and Rolls. The Gibsons scoring a win over Gypsy Joe and Jim Tucker. Now, Jamie, you mentioned to me that there was a uh, there was footage on the video that's out there on YouTube specifically of Austin Idol on this episode of television. Austin Idol scoring a win over Jack Poor. Well, I went back in time, looked up the matchup, and I found that it was actually filmed on the November 10th, 1980 edition of Georgia Championship Wrestling. Now, I will say this. It does appear as though it did air. It made air here on this episode of Georgia TV. And we talked about this a little bit with the IWL. We talked about this with Sunbelt and things when we were talking about uh, maybe the NWA promising certain guys some spots in order to get them not to work for these outlaw territories specifically the bigger names who may actually draw some money. And that could be what we're seeing here. We know they're going to announce Chief J Strongbow for an upcoming Omni card. Of course, he was in the IWL as well. Strongbow wouldn't even appear at the Omni show. So it, it seems like, uh, you know, it's dropped pretty quickly. IWL, IWL goes out of business. But here we go. Austin Idol, according to Thunderbolt Patterson, according to Jim Wilson, agreed to come in and work the IWL. A week or two later, here we see a video of Austin Idol from prior months yeah he really confused me because i thought it was you know part of the uh, the current show so i am happy to hear it was from a couple months before yeah it caught me off guard and i think the first time i went through here i didn't even question it i just said oh austin idol's back but then when you asked me hey austin idol's on here like is this really part of this episode and I, that's when i started thinking wait a minute he's not on the omni show he's not on you know next week's tv so I did a little looking. I saw Jack Poor. I haven't seen Jack Poor here since I feel like it was like January, maybe a little later than that. But I went back, looked up results, and boom, go all the way back to November for this match. So they pulled it out of stock footage, if you will, and played it here this week. But they're not even promising that Idol's returning to the company or anything like that. They're just making him known again. Maybe there was some discussion going on behind the scenes to keep Idol away from those outlaw territories down in uh, Florida and, of course, perhaps even the IWL. And the weird thing with this is they never say it's a VTR. The thing that I saw just, you know, wasn't Gordon leading into it. The match just kind of started. So you get, it's easy to get sucked in like I did, thinking it's a live match. Now, after listening to this and just finishing up watching next week's show, you remember how a couple months ago we had the, uh, the Mr. Wrestling 2 becoming a manager thing? Oh, yeah. How can I forget? And and I mentioned that there was no crowd right. voice in the background. And I said, that's actually it's happened several times now. I'm starting to think that when they finish that TV taping, like around noon or whatever, those that stayed around to be on best of the next day, right? they may have shot some interviews to put into the main show that night. I mean, you still have six hours to edit. Like when we get to the next show on the 16th, there's an interview with Ted DiBiase mm -hmm. and he's in street clothes. And the crowd is just completely quiet. There's no way DiBiase is standing up there and the crowd's going to be completely quiet. So yeah. I'm just kind of putting one-on-one -on -one together. I'm, I'm going to assume that they they did used to splice things into the, the 6 o'clock show. Right. I got you. Yeah, it's very, it's very possible. Like you said, maybe recording certain things before the show begins to kind of get it out of the way, especially some of the longer promos. Like DiBiase's promo you're referencing, it's a whole segment. There's a video and everything involved. So... But we'll right. get there when we get there. But it's it's excellent points you brought up there, Jamie, and I can't wait to. And get a lot there. of these guys got to get in the car and drive to Columbus, so maybe it's those that can hang around or yeah, I think you know, before time. But it's definitely yeah. it's placed into the uh, six oh five show, and I, I never thought about it until today. Yeah, and I think like usually there's Saturday evening stops is all the way up in Tennessee, Chattanooga, which is a hell of a drive. So it totally makes sense to now. Some of the guys do stick around, like you said, and work the uh, local towns as well, but not everybody. 
So it, it makes sense to get some of the things out of the way early. So they can maybe even leave during the taping if they need to. Right, and just go on their way. As we go on, we're going to look at some more house shows before we get into the following week. And the Omni card as well, guys. And right now we're talking about May the 9th. Later in the day, of course, TBS, uh, the taping takes place in the morning hours. Sorry, guys, for the spoiler, breaking that fourth wall for everybody, all the wrestling fans who didn't know. But we move on. They get in their cars, like you said, and they drive up to Chattanooga, the Memorial Auditorium on the card. Jerry Oates over Jim Duggan, Bobby Eaton defeating Ted Oates. It's Robert Gibson over the French Angel. Bobby Garrett getting a win here over Tommy Wright, no doubt in the opener. And in the main event of the night, Ted DiBiase and Tommy Rich. How about that for a team over the fabulous Freebirds? Yeah, it's a shame we didn't get to see more of Ted DiBiase and Tommy Rich. But we will in a couple years, just not o- as a team. Right. And the Oats boys splitting a, a win and a loss here. Ted Oates doing the job to Bobby Eaton. Jim Duggan doing the job to Jerry Oates. Very interesting. We fast forward May the 10th, Carrollton, Georgia at the fairgrounds, no results. So it's on to May the 11th in Augusta, back to the Bell Auditorium, Monday night. Iron Mike Sharp over Jim Duggan. It's Ricky Gibson defeating Bobby Eaton. Roberto Soto over Gypsy Joe. Brian St. John battling Robert Gibson to a time limit draw. Could have been fun. Also in the main event, it was the Freebirds. Gordy and Roberts over Tommy Rich and Ted DiBiase in a no disqualification match. Wonder if Michael Hayes had a play in that one. Hmm. I doubt it, but hey, back to Brian St. John for a second. Sure. I think what happened with St. John was later in the year, he ends up breaking his leg. Right, he does and get I don't, Yeah, I don't think that leg ever fully healed. He did some Florida after that, but he never got a push. So I'm wondering if the leg never recovered properly for him. Oh, good call. Good call. That's what I got you here for, Jamie. All these things just pop back up in your brain, and uh, I, I wasn't thinking about that. He does. I remember him getting injured. I didn't know if it was 81 or 82. So, uh, yeah, if it's if it's coming up, that makes a little sense. It's probably kept him out for a while. I don't know what kind of the extent of that injury, like you said, but I'm not sure if he tore something in his knee or what the uh, issue was there. But, yeah, it's unfortunate. Like I said, I would like to have seen a little more out of the guy, but good call there, Jamie. Yeah, Blind Squirrel finds a nut again. Well, every week. At least every week you're not on vacation. As uh, <laughs> we, we continue on. May the hey, when, you get, when you get old, you go on vacation. That's I, I can't works. wait to get old then, if that's how it works. I can't. And then in another year or so, I'll be on permanent vacation. Oh, we're going to be recording all the time then, huh? Is that what you're telling me? Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. As we roll on May the 12th, Macon, Georgia at the Coliseum. I don't have actual result results as far as who goes over, but the card looked like this. Mighty Yankee taking on Mike Sharp. I think he can figure that one out. French Angel against Robert Gibson. It's Gypsy Joe up against Roberto Soto. Bobby Eaton taking on Tommy Wright. Kind of a light card. Here on May the 12th, I think you can kind of figure out the winners of all those matches. And in the main event, obviously they retain. It's the Freebirds once again going up against Tommy Rich and Ted DiBiase. So this is one of those unusual weeks where we, where we see the main, same main event pretty much every night of the week. Usually they switch it up some, but not this week. It's uh, the Freebirds versus Rich and DiBiase all the way. As we continue on, May the 13th, Columbus, Georgia at the Memorial Auditorium. More of the same. I was talking about that main event. Once again, the Freebirds defeating Tommy Rich and Ted DiBiase. Also on the card, Mike Sharp scoring a win over Bobby Eaton. Eaton subbing for Jim Duggan here. Also, Ricky Gibson over the Mighty Yankee. Roberto Soto defeating Gypsy Joe. And Brian St. John going to a draw once again with Robert Gibson. Man, I would have really liked to have seen a couple couple of shows here this week. I here. mean, that, that is a both. Well, three nights in a row, that's three solid house shows. I mean, especially looking at it from the eyes of today and looking at the talent, you know that they, they had to be good shows. I mean, even Frank Morrell could entertain. He didn't have much speed left at that point, but he could still get the heel heat. Here's an odd one, though. We go back to that May 13th show, and it's this is the full card in this instance here in Columbus, and no Oates Brothers on the card. Very odd. Maybe they were on vacation. Maybe they were. Maybe they were. Uh, we continue on May the 14th. It's Statesboro, Georgia. Never heard of that one. And uh, May the 15th, Valdesta, Valdosta, Georgia at the Mathis Auditorium. No results for those shows. But again, got to work in these cities that we don't really talk about a whole lot. Give people idea of just about everywhere Georgia Championship Wrestling traveled, at least before they you know start going big into the uh, the other states and cities and things upcoming in the uh, next year. Oh, they definitely supplanted Georgia fans with enough wrestling action. Uh, everything was within a couple hour ride, and uh, guys probably really love to work the Georgia circuit. 
So we go on, Jamie. Uh, we're already here by the next following week's TV. And I should mention, guys, head over to my YouTube channel right now for this episode. May the 16th here, WTBS Studios for Georgia Championship Wrestling. One hour and 45 minutes of action, minus a few commercials. That's why it's not two full hours there on my YouTube. But I'm talking about YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. Go find it right now, guys. Subscribe to the channel. Always uploading new footage there. Lots of fun stuff. Great quality for this episode as well. And it appears to be the full episode, Jamie, again, minus some commercials. So it's pretty much all there. You guys can go watch this and enjoy it as we talk about it. Yes, it's definitely outstanding quality. Make sure you stay through the commercials toward the end of the show. There's a Boxcar Willie commercial. Oh, I remember that commercial so well from uh, from all of the 19- It felt like that was there for many years here in the 1980s, those Boxcar Willie uh, record albums, right? There's a Boxcar Willie commercial, a Bill Tush commercial. Oh, the Tush. And an Atlanta Brave commercial. Tush America's Turner. team, the Atlanta right. Braves. America's team, says Ted Turner. And remember, guys, now we're starting at a new time. 5.30 p.m. No more 6.05, Jamie. So weird. Going to shatter my world here. 5.30 to 7.30 right now. And remember, we also talked about some claims made by Jim Wilson that the time change was to counteract the IWL promotion, which also began airing TV around this time at 5.30 as well. If that's true or not, who's to say? Very interesting, though. If that is the truth, very easy just to blame on the Braves with a lot of 7 o'clock or 7.05. I mean, 7.35 starts. Yeah, and that was my... the wrestling up and you don't have the, the conflicts. Well, that was my guess, you know, before I got into all the IWL digging and things, was it was Braves-related. But I guess we'll never truly know, at least not at this point in time. As uh, the show kicks off, Gordon Soley standing at his brand new podium. He gets a podium now, welcoming everyone to the Georgia Championship Wrestling Program this week before it's off to the ring. And who is this ring announcer I wrote this week? I wrote Awful. He says the name first, the name of the, uh, the opponent. Here is the Gladiator, then their hometown. He's from Parts Unknown, then their weight. And he doesn't even announce it like a true ring announcer, just kind of talks it out. Here's the Gladiator. He's from Parts Unknown. He weighs 240. Not sure if you even caught that. No, I, I did. He, I don't know who that guy was. Throughout the show, he makes several uh, mistakes. Like he, um, well, I'll, I'll bring it up when we get to it. Go ahead. Please do. I don't have any more notes on him, so please do. You must have caught some things I didn't, so I'm looking forward to when you share those with us as the show continues on. But we kick things off our opening matchup this week. It's Iron Mike Sharp, still here, taking on the Gladiator. The referee for this one, Jim McGuire of Gulf Coast and Southeastern fame. And no forearm band here yet on Mike Sharp, I should point out for those fans accustomed to seeing one. But one thing's for sure, Mike Sharp, a legit strongman, dead weight lifting this burly gladiator onto the top rope at one point early on in the match. And then we get a full Nelson spot, but the masked man, he makes it to the ropes. In fact, we get several wrestling holds applied by Mike Sharp here. Gladiator to the ropes each and every time until finally Sharp unloads with a big clothesline and a swinging neckbreaker. Going to get the job done. Six minutes and 15 seconds. And I'm not sure who this gladiator was. His body, not in the greatest of shape, but he seemed a little aged to me and clearly a veteran of the ring. He knew where he was going in there. I was curious who you might thought who, who it was. I thought it was uh, Ed Timms. Really? Okay. I at, might have to go back and first, check that out. At first glance, that's who I thought it was. I didn't give it real deep thought, but just watching the match, they always like to throw Ed Timms and change the name, you know, yeah. throw him under a mask. And I'll that's be, who I just thought it was. Okay, I'll go back. I want to check that out again. I hate to watch a six-minute Mike Sharp match to do that. But I, I'm curious because, to me, the body came off like a little older, maybe a, a veteran just kind of worked the Georgia territory back in the day. It would have been cool to see if somebody stopped by and put out a mask here. But I don't know. I'm going to do a little more digging into that as we're off right now, guys, to another Mike Sharp promo. A couple of times uh, with the Gladiator, he was utilizing those ring ropes quite effectively. Yes, he was. He's a very tricky opponent. You have to watch him at all times. You know, many people say to me, Mike, you get in there and they feel that a man like this may not have a chance against me. But I want to point out one thing. If you let your guard down for one second, just a split second, you can find yourself flat on that mat and your opponent's hand is being raised. Well, there's certainly no question about the fact he uh, he took a lot of punishment, yet came back and meted out more and, uh, uh, frankly, appeared to have you in trouble at one point. He, he had me going a few times, I'll have to admit that. 
He's a tough man, aggressive man. He knows all the tricks in the book. And uh, I'm just glad to come out on top. And I'm looking forward to getting into the, some more matches here. I want all the competition that wants to come my way. I'm ready, I'm in shape, and just bring him on. Well, thank you so very much, Iron Mike Sharp, an outstanding athlete. Let me take just a moment, if I may, right now, to talk about uh, tomorrow night at the Omni here in Atlanta, an outstanding night of wrestling competition. Tickets are currently on sale at all seats, locations, the Omni and the Sports Arena. And the Sports Arena, of course, will be open tonight until 9. So may I suggest that you call now and make those reservations in advance. There will be a $5,000 round-robin tournament for the Georgia Heavyweight Championship. Contenders in that tournament include the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, uh, Iron Mike Sharp, Mr. Wrestling 2, Tommy Wildfire Rich, Ray Candy, Bruiser Brody, Greg Valentine, Ken Patera, Mike Boyer, and Bill Irwin. All of them competing tomorrow night for the Georgia Heavyweight Championship. And that is going to be quite a tournament. That's right. Uh, look at those names. They're all top men. These men are in demand all over the world. And I'm just proud to get in there. And I, I'm telling you, I, I'm looking forward to winning this belt. There's a beautiful belt right here. And it means a lot. And there's a lot of prestige that goes along with this belt. And I'll tell you, I like nothing better than to come out with my hand raised, wearing this belt, and $5,000 in my pocket. So not quite that gravelly Iron Mike voice I'm accustomed to hearing bellow throughout, like, Boston Garden, if you will, or the Spectrum. But much like his armband, that too will come with time. Uh, Mike Sharp says, if you let your guard down just a split second, it's easy to lose to anyone. Well, he let his guard down quite a bit in the WWF then. Uh, Sharp, one of the many names involved in that upcoming Georgia heavyweight title tournament tomorrow night at the Omni. And I like this position that they're doing with, with Sharp here. He's a, you know, a new baby face. I won't say he's muscular, but he's definitely thick. There, there's a lot of man there. Yeah, to say the least. He's a and, huge man. Mike Sharp is huge. And he's somebody that they can develop. I, I mean, that, that's probably what Bill... Bill Watts is still in charge here, so that's probably Watts' thinking because Watts is going to bring him into Mid-South in, you know, six months from now. Yeah, unbelievably, that will happen, and he will get a good push there as a baby face as well, so it doesn't go heel with Mike Sharp, which I always thought he was a much better heel, not that I thought he was ever a main event level on as a baby or a heel, but I, I, I enjoyed Mike as a heel more so than a baby face. I'm just not buying it. He's not a great promo by any stretch of the imagination. Certainly not as a good guy. And uh, I, he just, he's lacking something for me. And it was hard to buy him in that position. He, he's in in mid South as well, because he's pushed pretty high up there to the top uh, versus what, where he's at right here. Now, I don't mind this at all. Making a part of the tournament, adding more names again, like you said, he's a big dude. You buy him as a, a credible challenger in the ring. Yeah. He's going to give any top heel, a run for their money, whether he beats them right now, probably not, but he's definitely going to be a formidable challenger to him. And here's something else to think about. You and I both know who's coming up next on this show. Right. Do you uh. think Mike Sharp consulted with anyone on how to end that last match? Ooh, good call. Um, No, I would say no. It's a TV squash. Just go out there and, and get the win. You and do you think minutes. when he walked behind the curtain, somebody gave him some crap? If he was paying attention, absolutely. I, I, I would have to imagine this particular man would, would give anybody crap for less, less reason. So go ahead. We're just about there. So who Jamie's referring to, if you guys haven't figured it out by now, we talked about a swinging full Nelson. Well, this is a, a man who does a different type of swinging full Nelson or a swinging neck breaker, if you will. And I'm referring to... Ken Patera, Ken Patera back in town here in Georgia Championship Wrestling. Let's go to a promo now. Gordon Sully standing by with Ken. Well, and you heard him. Uh, he's coming over here at this particular time. Ken Patera, ladies and gentlemen. Ken, uh, welcome back to Georgia, first of all. Well, thank you, Gordon. Now, I want to get one thing straight. I heard you out here calling me Ken Patera. It's not Ken Patera. It's Ken Patera, the world's strongest wrestler. Okay? Now we got ourselves straight, huh? tell you what, there are a lot of people here who uh, I'm sure have read about your exploits in the past, but I think for those who might not be familiar with you, let's go back, uh, if we may, for just a couple of moments, high school, college, and then, uh, of course, your fabulous uh, career with the Olympics. 
You know, everybody's talking about Tony Atlas down here for so many years about being the strongest wrestler in the world. Bruno Sarmatino up in New York. Ivan Putski over in Poland. This guy, that guy. Well, you're looking at the man, the only man in professional sports that can legitimately say that he has gone to the Olympics, gone to the Pan American Games, set 54 world and international class records in weightlifting. So that qualifies me over all the rest of these so-called strong professional athletes and the number one sport, the king of sports is professional wrestling. So you people out there in TV land, just listen up. This is the man that, the only man in the world to ever win four gold medals in the Pan American Games. The first man in history to lift 500 pounds over his head. That's not laying down on my back and doing a bench press, which is a sissy exercise. It's from the floor overhead. The only man in America to ever do it. And that was over 10 years ago. You know, isn't that fabulous? Well, it is indeed. You had a fabulous uh, career all the way down the line. And, of course, uh, now uh, internationally known, as you said, uh, the world's strongest wrestler. Hey, without a doubt. I have toured Japan. I've been in Germany, South Africa, South America, Mexico. I've been all over. The only place I did miss is Georgia, and I have whipped everybody's behind between here and there. Well, the Georgia people and everywhere else where this TV goes, they're going to hear about Ken Patera. I've been in the Big Apple. Everybody knows the Big Apple. New York City, and I ruled and conquered and destroyed everything there, and now I'm here, and I'm going to do likewise, baby. Okay, thank you so very much. Ken Patera, who wants to be known as the world's uh strongest wrestler and uh, he is a, a phenomenal individual there's certainly no question about that so there it is you talked about the similarities there mike sharp using an actual swinging neck breaker of course patera referring to his finisher as a swinging neck breaker i love where you went with that i love that you noticed that it was it was fun stuff there but patera boasting to be the world's strongest wrestler and was not happy when Gordon did not acknowledge him as such. That's right. That's it, it, At the beginning of the hour as well, Gordon kind of left out certain people, and Kenny was one of them. And he's done that in the past with heels. I'm not sure he's done it with the Freebirds. I'm not sure if Gordon does that on purpose or not. But you're right. Gordon Sully also failing to mention uh, Patera's prowess as the world's strongest man, if you will. And Kim Patera doing Ken Patera here, I wrote in my notes. A natural heel if there ever was one. If you didn't hate Patera after watching this interview, you would never hate Patera. At least all these years later, you you can watch it back and appreciate the uh, asshole he was. But in the kayfabe era, you had to hate this guy, no matter what. And Kim Patera says people talk about Tony Atlas, the Bruno San Martinos, the Ivan Putskis, all being from strong. Poland. From, Poland, from Poland, of course. Well, of course he's from Poland. Everybody knows that. Uh, but Patera says he's the only true strongest man in all of professional wrestling, and his credentials... They've proven it. Kenny referring to the bench press as a sissy exercise because he lifts 500 plus pounds over his head. It's true. He's done it. The only American to do it at this point, Jamie. Yeah. And that was what the Pan Am games, right? Where he did that. Yeah. Patera set a lot of records at this point. I mean, uh, he says he's with people everywhere, most recently in New York City, but all around the world. And now he's here in Georgia. To continue on that onslaught, Kim Patera, another man, part of that Georgia title tournament. He's going to have an impact on Georgia wrestling for the next two months, so just stay tuned because it's going to be the Kim Patera show. I'm here for it, guys. It's uh, much better than what I'm covering right now of Kim Patera in uh, late 87 WWF, that's for sure. As we head to the ring, we see Patera taking on Jim Tucker here. and we It's a nice suplex across the ring, launching Tucker with a suplex, and then Patera with that patented body toss he does. Always love that move. And eventually, it is the full Nelson putting Tucker down. Not necessarily the swinging neckbreaker version of it here this week, yet. But he does get the win here with the full Nelson, his neckbreaker. Three minutes time, and Kenny even holding Tucker in that full Nelson while driving his face into the buckle after the matchup. Fun heel stuff here from one of the best to ever do it. I had fun watching Patera just maul this poor guy and that full Nelson into the buckle, just insult to injury. Yeah, I was a big Ken Patera guy. I mean, not only with his WWF run here, but I was starting to get involved in watching wrestling when he was in, in 76 and 77 with that wild blonde hair and everything. And then getting to see him again 
on the World's Strongest Man competition. Him and Superstar Billy Graham, I think, were in the same one that, uh, 78, 79. But Terry was in a few of those, the Strongman competitions. And, uh, I can't rem- man, I, I used to watch those all the time when they would, when they would come on ESPN in the late eighties, early nineties. But I don't, re- I, it w- I would always pop because, oh my God, I get to see a wrestler outside of wrestling doing cool shit. If I remember correctly, they were part of the CBS Sports Spectacular show, which was CBS's version of the Wild World of Sports. Okay. Well, that would explain how they made air. Uh, I, I was I always loved watching those early ones like that, seeing guys like Akim Patera later, a Bill Kazmaier. And of course, they stepped in the rings, made different levels of success in the ring, but it was still people I knew from the wrestling world. It's always interesting to see someone from outside of the wrestling world enter into it. Oh, yeah, most definitely. It truly is. Well, some swim, but most of them sink. And uh, Patera, though, a full success coming from his weightlifting background into the world of professional wrestling. Everybody knows the story, the Kim Patera story, not the one from the WWF, but just his success as a wrestler. If you're listening to this, you know who Kim Patera is. I don't have to explain to you guys the legendary, the legend of one Kim Patera, who also uh, invades uh, Gordon's privacy here after the matchup. He talked to promo before the match. Patera a little more afterwards as well, referring to Mike Sharp here as a big lug. Don't hear that every day. Uh, It says Mike Sharp out here putting his dirty hands on that Georgia title earlier as Gordon was showing it off during the Sharp promo. But the belt will soon belong to Ken Patera, who also alludes to that $10,000 bounty that the Freebirds put on Tommy Rich in that tournament as well. So Patera not only talking about winning the belt, winning that money that's up for grabs as part of the tournament, but also maybe capitalizing and capturing that bounty on Tommy Rich. And he also liked Gordon's new little podium he had out there. Yeah, it's a nice little nifty. Right before he picks up the NWA belt, he said, I like your little desk here, Gordon. He pick, picks up the uh, the Georgia belt. Georgia, you know, spending a few bucks now. I mean, Florida had the table. Now Georgia's got a podium here in GCW. Very cool. And they just got the new background. Yeah, that too. So there was Patera kind of hinting at taking out Tommy Rich. And speaking of the wildfire, up next in the ring, it's the former NWA world champion, Tommy Rich, defeating Buck Brannigan. Brannigan is apparently the latest to come to town to take on Rich for that $10,000 bounty. He's going for it here. No success. As Buck, he's a big boy, and he gets in some good shots here on Tommy, but it's Rich with the Thez Press that's going to get the win in five minutes and 10 seconds, so Rich will live to fight another day. Omni, here he comes, as we're off right now to hear from the wildfire. And of course, tomorrow night at the Omni, Tommy, uh, it comes down to the fact that there's a $10,000 bounty by Michael Hayes and the Freebirds out on you. You know, listen, you could call it Tommy Rich's life, the Georgia heavyweight belt. You know, I said Harley Race, I wanted some more of him. I proved I could beat him. He's been beat. So if I get that Georgia belt, Gordon, that means I've got another shot coming at Harley Race. Michael Hayes, Mr. Sissy, Mr. Funny Boy, or whatever you are, just like I told you before, you lay all of your $10,000 bounties out, but when it comes to Hayes, I'm going to go through them all, you know, and in that tournament, you know, Dusty Moat Rhodes might want some $10,000, you never know, Hayes, who will want $10,000, but believe one thing, I'm going to be looking. $5,000 $5,000 for winning the belt. Everything's on the line. The Omni. And Hayes, I'm making you a promise. When I walk out, I'm going to go through your bounty hunters. I'm going to walk out with the Georgia belt. And I'm going to be number one in this next stage race. And they talk that $10,000 bounty on Tommy Rich tomorrow night in the Omni. Maybe even Dusty Rhodes will want a shot at that ten grand, But Dusty don't need no ten grand. Come on, Tommy. Think the bigger picture, if you will. Sorry, guys, for my dusty impression while I have allergies, but I had to get it in. This is just like a preview of what is to come, where every interview had to include Dusty Rhodes. So Tommy had to include Dusty Rhodes in the interview. Well, that will continue through 1988 as far as Jim Crockett promotions goes anyway. But I, I just thought it was funny here. You know, I had to, if this were real, okay, just to suspend your disbelief for a minute, guys. If this were real, Tommy talking about Dusty coming for ten grand, we know what's coming, me and you anyway, in the, in the bigger picture, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Dusty, doesn't. he's not worried about that ten grand. He's not even really worried about that Georgia title. We know what he's looking at right now, Jamie. I would say by this point he knows what he's looking at. You don't think he's always looking at that? But the I mean, storyline here is that the Georgia title will get him a title shot, which he's not supposed to have anymore. True. 
That is true, and uh, that's that's way that's good, another good way to look at it. I like that. I like the storytelling there from Mr. Jamie Ward, and maybe Georgia, you may, might be giving them a little extra credit there. But Tommy Rich, he's already been promised another world title shot by Harley Race whenever he wants it. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, if Tommy ever cashes that in. As uh, we head back to the ring, another one bites the dust begins to play, which only means it's the Junkyard Dog teaming with Ted DiBiase, defeating the team of Tom Yancey and Jim Duggan here. And boy, is this Mid-South Riffic. Look at this, Jamie. Jim Duggan in there against DiBiase and the dog. Uh, Yancey takes quite a beatdown from the baby faces and the JYD thump as well. Then DiBiase tagged in, nailing his own version of the power slam before the figure four going to get the win here over Yancey in five minutes and 15 seconds. In the finish of the matchup, Jim Duggan was sent out of the ring by JYD and Duggan decides to just leave Yancey to fend for himself in the final moments. Fun stuff here all around for a squash. You know, Tommy Rich may be the num- considered the number one face here at the time. Right. But JYD and DiBiase, their, their pops with that television crowd rival, if not surpass, Tommy Rich. You know, to think about how the, the short period of time that Dog's been here as compared to DiBiase or the fact that Tommy Rich has been here in the past, he's already done the world title chase prior and things of that nature. Dog rivals any of them as far as popularity goes. And he's not even here every week. He's working the Mid-South Territory at the same time. So he's coming and going, showing up for the Omni shows, doing TV when he can. But Dog, he's right there. It's just another level of charisma that you just don't see very often at all. Now, and imagine if, and we've kind of discussed this different points. Imagine if Watts and Barnett at this point say, let's do this thing together and let's take over. I'm going to forget about my Mid-South. And let's concentrate on Georgia. What they could have accomplished with JYD and DiBiase at the top of the card. Yeah, and I mean, really, you've got nothing in between Georgia other than other than uh, Southeastern. You've got really nothing in between Watts and Georgia. So they could have really got taken care of that Southern, that entire seaboard and, and all the way, you know, over maybe up to Texas anyway. So it would have been very interesting to see what we could have gotten out of that, especially with the cable exposure. JYD was just at the top of his game at this point, not work-wise, but popularity-wise. Oh, there's no doubt about it. As we head off right now, we're going to hear from the dog. He's standing by with Gordon Soley and, of course, his partner, Ted DiBiase. Big Jim Duggan just leading his partner in the ring, walked away in total disgust. Let me see if I can't get the junkyard dog and Ted DiBiase over here, because uh, tomorrow night, gentlemen, at the Omni, no time limit, no disqualification. You two against the Freebirds. That's right, Hayes. You just saw an example right there of what this man and myself have got in store. We're fired up. We're keyed up, Hayes, because in less than 24 hours, in the Omni, in Atlanta, no disqualification, no time limit, no rules. If we want to chase you to the top of the Omni, we can't. Tell them about it, dog. You know, Hayes, the good thing about it, I got both of my peekaboos back, Hayes. So you stick that long blind head of yours in the ring one time, honey child, and I'm going to make you mine. Well, I'll tell you what, gentlemen, it's going to be quite a night indeed. No time limit, no disqualification. Anything goes. That means that the dog can turn, ah, turn loose and get shown up nasty. And that's exactly what I'm going to do because you got too many top stars in it right now, baby. I should speak louder than words, dog. Tomorrow Let's do it tomorrow, tomorrow night. Let's just show night. everybody. Tickets on sale at all seats, locations, the sports arena open till 9 tonight. So there it is. Pretty generic promo, but they get their point across. All the time for talking is done. Tomorrow night, it's DiBiase and the dog taking on the Freebirds, this time in a rematch of no disqualification is the rules here, which means there are no rules. His dog says, and I had to laugh at this, he says, I got both of my peekaboos back, meaning his vision has returned. And Michael Hayes, honey child, you in trouble. Yeah, but Michael Hayes isn't worried. Michael Hayes always has a plan, and the Freebirds always come out on top in the end. Oh, damn you and the Freebirds, Jamie. I was trying to put over an awesome dog promo here. That's all I was trying to get out but, of this. But, but it was an awesome dog promo. I mean, if I was in Atlanta at that time, I'd be headed down to that night to the arena to get my tickets to go see this, this show. This is, and it's just a typical promo, generic promo, guys. I know it wasn't it, nothing fancy here, but just the simple wording that he used. This is how he captured the fans' hearts, just talking about getting his peekaboos back. And, and yeah, I call Michael Hayes, honey that. child, that man. Great. I haven't heard Honey Child since the 1980s, so I loved it. I popped 
both of those comments there in this promo there. I love the Junkyard Dog. One of my favorites. I told the story. He was the, the first LJN figure I wanted. He was my favorite thumb wrestler as a kid. Uh, he was my favorite wrestler there in 84, 85, as far as the WWF went. Like, for me, I was never the Hulk Hogan guy. So I was always looking for somebody else to be my favorite. And Dog, that first year there or whatever it was, he was my favorite. So I got a little bit of enjoyment as JYD is my hero as well. Yeah, not only did I put down the money as soon as I heard the Freebirds were coming to the Spectrum in August, uh -huh. I think it was, it was October or, or November when I heard that JYD was coming to be Sergeant Slaughter's partner at the Spectrum against Sheik and Volkoff. And I went to that show live also. And wow. JYD got a louder pop that night than Sergeant Slaughter. And I would say it would even rival anything that Hulk Hogan had had up to that point, that arena. And I had gone a couple of times to see Hogan. I can't, when he I, first came into the WWF, I, I really thought he had a chance to be a really solid number two. And it started out that way, but unfortunately it didn't finish that way because his personal demons just got involved. Yeah, it's the demons, and I'm sure it was a little bit of politics too, brother. But uh, it's it, it's a sad you know story for the junkyard dog who I just was a huge fan. I mean, natural charisma out the yin yang. I love his promos even in '87. He's doing nothing in the WWF, and he's cutting all these like shoot promos and shit. Nobody's paying attention, so they just they let him fly in the air anyway. He's talking about his past history with Ted DiBiase, you know, their friendship, even though he's the million dollar man. Near the end of the year here, he's cutting promos for Billy Redlines for Canadian localized promos. And he's doing like Stu Hart's voice. And he's talking about how Stu used to talk to him when he was there. And he's referring to himself as Big Daddy because he was Big Daddy Ritter in Stampede. So it's always right. fun listening to the dog. Dog didn't give no shit. He just did his thing. Dog entertained me all the way up through his WCW run. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but... He was just a dog, so I still enjoyed him at that point. Yeah, as a fan, I wasn't looking at work rate, man. I just give me the characters that I loved, and JYD was certainly one of those guys. And we'll talk more about Dog when we get to the Omni tomorrow. But for right now, it's another promo. We keep selling that Georgia title tournament, but we also keep selling that $10,000 bounty on the head of Tommy Rich, which has been placed into that tournament. And one of the other participants involved in that tournament was brought in specifically to take out Tommy Rich. I'm talking about the evil Russian, Nikolai Volkov. And right now we're going to hear from your favorite, Jamie. It's Michael Hayes standing by with Volkov. I want to take a moment now, if I may, to uh, find out just... A Whoa! I got something to say. And now that we got the trash and the scum out the way, then I'm going to say it. I see they got your little desk here, huh? <laughs> I told everybody, I told, tell you what, why don't you give me that microphone? I told everybody out there that I had my own personal bounty hunter. Now I can tell you that this man can bench press 600 pounds. Or I can tell you that he can squat over 575 pounds. But the most impressive thing about him that I'm going to tell you about is that he hurts and he cripples people and he likes money which I have in fact I had ten thousand dollars and all you have to do to collect it is break Tommy Rich's arm <laughs> ten thousand American dollars for myself to break the pencil and kick Tommy Rich break his hand I go show you Tommy Rich you ugly face you yellow belly cow Now, now, Ray, did you notice that these two interviews were back to back? No sooner did DiBiase and Dog walk away, here then comes, he brings Michael Hayes out. Yes, here, here comes Hayes and Volkov right onto the set. They should at least split it apart a little bit. Now, you being from the New York territory, you're going to give me shit about this right here because I agree with you. When I saw this, I'm like, really? I'm supposed to believe that Dog and DiBiase, who were blinded and had their neck uh, everything but broken are just cool with walking away as they see Michael Hayes make his way out. 
But let's talk just really quickly about years of Vince McMahon talking with champion and challenger in the main events of those garden cards. Uh, they're clearly standing on the uh, opposite sides of Vince waiting for their turn at the promo. They, they barely give five seconds time in between. So I, I, I always question that as well. But I get what you're saying. I was thinking the same thing you're talking about right here, because if you watch it straight through, go back and check it out on YouTube, guys. If there is no break. There's no pause. We see DiBiase and Dog leave. Gordon waits about five seconds, and then out comes Michael Hayes. Yeah, because you would have thought Michael Hayes would at least uh, hit him with a party shot as they were walking away. You know, a little cheap shot that maybe they don't hear or something. Right. But my own, my only other guess is uh, when they cut this up for syndication, there might have been a break at that point. Could have been, but there wasn't here on the main 605 broadcast on TBS, no. so it's very noticeable. And I like what you said there. Michael Hayes didn't even like take a shot at them as they walked away. Well, there they go. Salt and pepper, or one of Michael Hayes' favorite lines or something along. You know what I'm talking about. Hayes doing Hayes. Here you guys the- keep on keep on going like the coward you are. Go, 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 That's go. That's right. Go. Keep on running. You know, waving a hand and there was nothing. Just went went right yeah. to this. You better get to packing because tomorrow night you're out of the company or whatever. Yeah, but Michael Hayes just kind of walked out like it was just a separate promo, like you said. But here we heard him. He's offering Nikolai ten thousand American dollars, very important, to break Tommy Rich's arm. Tomorrow night at the Omni, Michael Hayes even instructing Volkov to break his opponent's arm here today on television. Give us a little taste of tomorrow, a day early, and some bleeping there. I don't know if you caught that at the end. A very lengthy uh, muted out too, comment only- made by Michael Hayes. So whatever he says, in my opinion anyway, whatever he's ordering Volkov to do to his opponent Johnny King here, and based on the fact that King is African American, I don't think I want to know what Hayes said, but... That's 1981 bleeping, mind you guys. Didn't happen all the time. Yeah, I'm going to guess it was probably a little racial overtone over the top. And they actually cut it on TBS, which is a, a good move by them. But now we're getting into this match. And well, let's get back to whoever this ring announcer was. Yes. I didn't think he called him Johnny King. I thought he called him Sonny King. It's very possible. Johnny King pretty well put together to the point where I had to go do a little Google. I was like, is this Rocky King? It's That's who I thought it was. I thought it was a young Rocky King. By but it looks like Rocky doesn't break into the business for several more years. But could it have been? Could he have just been given an opportunity based on his look? I'm still wondering to this moment, could this be Rocky King, this Johnny King here? If anybody has any information, please get a hold of me and Jamie. Let us know. I'm still stuck on this potentially being Rocky King. Go check out the video for yourself, guys. Let us know what you think. Yeah, please do. Because I, like Ray just said, I thought it was Rocky King. Uh, they do put a close-up on his face at at least one point. So we can actually freeze it, take a picture, then try to match it up You know, a couple years later to see maybe it's a younger version. Yeah, I might try of, to do that. Of Rocky King. I'm not, you know, it's it's unfortunately, it's Nikolai just pounding away on this poor guy, Michael Hayes, accompanying to ringside. So acting as the corner man, the manager, if you will, here for Nikolai in this matchup, Volkov going to score the win over Johnny King by submission. As King, he appears to be only maybe 120 pounds soaking wet here, but again, well put together, as was Rocky King. Uh, Volkov just relentless on King's arm throughout the matchup, trying to break it. The entire time as a Nikolai off the middle rope with a stomp into the arm while it's in a hammerlock position. Very nasty. And then he locks in the hammerlock. And for once, it's kind of a believable finisher as this one is over by submission. Nikolai getting the win with the hammerlock in just two minutes and 30 seconds. And you kind of believe he really broke the guy's arm. Yeah. And listen to Gordon's commentary back to Mr. King. That's what Gordon called him at least twice during the match. Right. Because I don't think he caught the first name where they never gave him a cue card with what the guy's name was. Yeah, it was, it was never really properly I, I, that I rem- I don't know how I got the name Johnny King, but I, I got it, pulled it out of somewhere. So maybe that's inaccurate. Maybe it was Rocky King. I'm not sure. We're going to, we're going to back, back to Volkov. I'm sorry. Yeah, back back sure. to Volkov uh, real quick. Volkov is a very believable bounty hunter. We were talking about how big Mike Sharp is. Look at the size of Volkov. Oh, even yeah. this, Another guy he, that's just, uh, He's coming off that Florida run with, was it Koloff and uh, Stuart Alfred Hayes. So I, I'm guessing he's stopping over here in Georgia for a month or so before he goes up to Mid-Atlantic. But he was a massive individual. Yeah, that's that's putting it mildly. Volkov just uh, an enigma as far as size goes. The guy was not, by the 1980s, was not very good in the ring whatsoever, Jamie. But he certainly looked the part, fit the bill. 
he was did enough to get it done in the ring. He was very believable as far as that size goes. That really played a favor for him. Obviously, a really good guy because he continued to have jobs all the way into the early 1990s in the big leagues with Vince and things. So Volkov clearly well well liked by promoters anyway, as he always seemed to find a way somewhere at all times. Yes, uh, matter of fact, I um, I worked at Dennis Carluzzo's show with him in the early 90s. Yeah, didn't get a lot of time to talk to him, but he he was very nice. You know, he's one of those guys that really got around on the indies all throughout the 1990s, and I guess even maybe into the 2000s a little. But he and I went to a lot of indie shows, and I, I met a lot of guys and things. But I think I don't recall ever crossing paths with Volkov, unfortunately. But I, I always give him crap. But as a kid, I again I wasn't paying attention to work rate. I knew he didn't do a lot of moves. But uh, somewhere around the mid 80s, he certainly fell off the wagon as far as uh, wrestling goes. But that baby face turn they gave him over Boris, even, you know, in 1990 with the WWF, I liked that. That was fun for me. Something, you know, just he found the right way. You know, he saw the light. He joined America, for God's sake. So, I, I you know, it, his story for me ended on a high note as a kid. Nikolai Volkov turned baby face in the World Wrestling Federation. But going back, he, he was fun up until eh, somewhere around the mid 80s. Some of those power moves are just insanely impressive. Oh, yeah. Even the Mid-South run that he's going to have with that, the end of 83 and 84 was good stuff. And then he gets another Georgia run in 84 before they get bought up and he goes back to the WWF. Back to Vince, where he will stay for quite a while after that time. But Volkov, just believable here. A 300 plus pound man trying to rip an arm off of a man who weighs maybe a buck 20. Very believable visually here as a Volkov going to get the submission win. What can he do to Tommy Rich tomorrow night? We'll find out. It won't be too long as uh, we see Freddie Miller out here next announcing some of the upcoming events, Columbus, Ohio on the 24th, Huntington, West Virginia on the 25th, and they're going to be moving Marietta over to Thursdays moving forward. So guys who are keeping score as far as dates and results, Marietta, the uh, the house shows there in Marietta, Georgia, the Cobb County uh, Civic Center or whatever it was called, they'll be moving over to Thursday nights. Yeah, maybe that's so the Armstrongs can work some shows. We'll have to see. I, I, Maybe that's their, they're off night wherever they are right now. I guess they're over with um, Fuller at this point. Are you saying they're moving the show specifically just to get an Armstrong on the show? I'll go along Oh, with yeah. That. They, they love the Armstrongs. Just like Columbus is Oatesville. Not too Marietta many Armstrongs yet here in 81, though. Not too many Armstrongs yet. But Brad's on the way. Brad is the man. Uh, we will go on here, guys. We see a VTR from Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Greg Valentine scoring a win over Steve Muslin. That's the uh, also known as Steve Travis. Uh, Valentine going to score the win here with the hammer, the big elbow drop. Valentine, once again, another name added to that Georgia heavyweight title tournament tomorrow night as well. And then it's back to the studio where we're going to hear from the fabulous Freebirds. Huntley back in black. <laughs> yeah. You know that film of Greg Valentine? It's mighty fun. As you notice, $10,000 gets a lot of people running. I mean, a lot of top talent. Just go down, make a list, and think about all the people running after $10,000. Greg Valentine, Ken Patera, Boozer Brody. You talking about mean and nasty dudes. But you know what? Today's a special day. You know what today is? Today is Buddy's birthday. Today is Buddy's birthday. And what I want you to do is I want you to go out tonight and just get as nasty as you can get. Because tomorrow happens to be one year that Buddy's been with us. One full year. And I say, why don't you turn me loose? Why don't you just go ahead and turn me loose and let me do it my way or no way at all? And you know how my way is, don't you, buddy? And I know you know how my way is. And I think tomorrow, on the anniversary of Buddy being with us, that's a nice time to get wild. And I suggest that if anybody was to come messing with you tomorrow, that you should give them just exactly what they deserve tomorrow or any time. Because people keep pushing, but you're going to get pushed right back. Well, what about this man Volkov that you brought in? I'm, I'm really curious about this. I know well of his hey, reputation. Uh, th th there's nothing to say. You saw what he did to the little kid. He broke his arm. It's the same thing he's going to do to Tommy Rich. <laughs> All right, there it was Michael Hayes recently celebrated his birthday. We talked about that. I think it was March the 29th, but tonight it's apparently Buddy Roberts' birthday. 
Actually, it's on June the 16th, but don't let that get in the way of a good story. Also, tomorrow makes Buddy's one-year anniversary since joining the Freebirds. Also inaccurate. He was there much earlier than this in 1980, maybe the end of 79. But again, don't let that stand in the way of a good story, Jamie. It's pro wrestling. The truth gets mixed up all the time. And, and besides, you know, as well as I do, Michael, you know, was probably there on a load. You got to forgive him. Yeah, he has. His memory's not perfect. Just like well, my memory at, right now. At least now you admit perfect. it. His, his memory was perfect. I, I can admit uh, Michael Hayes' dark side. Okay. Just making sure. But he was a functioning dark sided kind of guy. He, he could still do the job for he the most part. He certainly brought in the money, that's for sure. But uh, I think this is going to wrap it up as far as the Freebird promos goes here this week. It's all going to go down tomorrow night. The bounty on Tommy Rich. And, of course, that no disqualification rematch. The Birds taking on the dog and Ted DiBiase. Going to be a barn burner. So I lied. I thought we were done with the Birds. But, no, instead, we're off to the ring. It is the National Tag Team Champions. Freebirds and Tag Team Action here. Gordy and Roberts taking on the team of Roberto Soto and Tommy Wright. So, finally, after months... We get Soto on film here in 1981, Georgia. Unfortunately, it's uh, Tommy Wright getting his ass handed to him almost the entire matchup. Soto, though, finally hot tagged in at the end. He tries to come in a house of fire, but tries to flying head scissors on Gordy out of the corner. But Michael Hayes jumping up on the apron and pops Soto with one of those quick jabs. Cool spot here. Uh, All this, of course, behind the referee's back, I should add. And Tommy Wright going to tag back in right away. I'm sure he loved that one. He got maybe 10 seconds of rest here. But Wright does give it a go this time, and on Gordy, for that matter. But Buddy Robertson with a bulldog, and Gordy then with the nasty pile driver. And uh, Gordy doesn't even release the hole, dropping the pile driver and just holding right there on his head in a pile driver position on the mat. Just a nasty spot, giving the Freebirds the win. The match went seven minutes. The reason Gordy held him straight up was mm-hmm. he didn't want to injure the man. Oh. He, he knows he accidentally injured Ted DiBiase when he was just, just trying to stun the guy to, to get a win. It took four times to stun him enough to get the win. Taking precautions. This time around, he, he, he held him straight up, let him get a little breath back, and then gently put him back down, and then covered him for the one, two, three. It's the kind of guy Terry Gordy was. Oh, those baby face free birds. Now, Tommy Wright, he's going to go on uh, and get a, an attempted push as Richard Blood. Very interesting why they kept wanting to use that name. For various guys in various territories, uh, he's going to go on to beat Richard Blood here later at the end of 1981 and all throughout 1982 in the Dallas Territory. Uh, but it was a seven-minute beatdown here for Richard Blood, Tommy Wright, if you will, this week at the hands of the fabulous Freebirds. But I don't know if you ever caught that. Richard Blood, for those who don't know, I believe the real name of Ricky Steamboat. But it, they also used that name for Tito Santana in certain territories down there as well. So it's kind of weird how that name was recycled various times, even though it actually belonged to Ricky Steamboat. Right. I saw that a picture of Tito as Richard blood and Hogan as Sterling golden in the same wrestling review magazine in early 1980, which which actually also covered the Inoki back on title changes. Oh, did it? Well, see, they do exist. I knew it. Yeah. It's, it's out there. Oh, yeah, the video's definitely out there. Good stuff. It's just the WWF never acknowledged those title changes, so they don't acknowledge well, that's that. Well, little... because those matches weren't sanctioned and supervised by the Athletic Commission. Oh, is that what it was? Because they yes. were in Japan? There was no, is there an Athletic Commission in Japan? Not a United States-based Athletic Commission. Oh, I see. So it just doesn't count. Why put the title on the line to begin with? I don't know. Back on wasn't supposed to. He got in trouble for that. After oh, it was one of those Harley Race Baba things. I gotcha. Yeah, it, it, he... He cashed in. We all know back on wasn't an angel. We found that out 14 years later, but we all know the truth on Bob Backman. Shenanigans. I get it. All right. Very cool. So we did hear a promo here from the birds, a soundbite I had queued up earlier. The Freebirds again talking with Gordon Solier. Quick outro promo after the matchup. Michael Hayes reiterating that Nikolai Volkov, the latest bounty hunter, coming directly for Tommy Rich and the Freebirds. Also coming for JYD and DiBiase. It all happens tomorrow night, guys. But first, it's the Birds off to Lawrenceville later tonight. So putting over their upcoming house show later in the evening. That's good business right there. Put over where you're going. That way you can make any last-minute ticket sales. Yeah, it was always cool when they would announce these specific towns because it felt like they were talking directly to you and it really made you want to come and see the show, whether the babyface mentioned the city and you popped for it because... Hey, Dusty or JYD or whoever mentioned my town, 
or the heels talking bad about your city. Ooh, I can't wait to come see that Michael Hayes get his, uh, get his due. Yeah, John McAdam and I on one of his podcasts uh, discussed how when we watched TBS, our, one of our favorite segments was Freddie Miller announcing where everybody was going. Yeah, I, I always loved it. That's why I bring them up here on the show whenever I see them on those, because I, I enjoy those segments as well with Freddie. Yeah, and every every now and then, uh, especially on the Best Of show, they would talk about one of those little house shows that was coming up and, and what would uh, occur at them. So show goes on, and this name came out of nowhere. I don't even think he's part of the Omni show. I'm talking about Chief Wahoo McDaniel randomly pops up here in Atlanta, scoring a win over Buck Brannigan. And Brannigan, he laid in some shots, but came running into a big Wahoo chop, nasty chop, and another big Wahoo chop across the chest, and then the double underhook suplex, going to give McDaniel the win in just three minutes. As we're off right now, Gordon Sully standing by with the big chief himself. Uh, as I said, a total aggressor at all times. When he steps into that ring, he's there for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is uh, to very quickly uh, defeat his opponent. Wahoo uh, is, uh, I say, the man, uh, many times you think you've got him, and all of a sudden you find yourself in even more trouble, as Mr. Brannigan did. Well, Gordon, I think uh, a lot of that's new experience. I don't think anybody's wrestling as long as I have, should have experience. And, uh, I'm enjoying being back here on Atlanta TV. I've been absent for a while. I've been traveling all over the world. I'm looking forward to getting back in here. Well, I'll tell you this. I know that the fans are certainly looking forward to it because you have to go down the pike as one of the most popular competitors, uh, young and old alike, uh, uh, certainly uh, enjoy your competitive spirit. Well, you know, Gordon, I've been traveling all over the world. Everywhere you go, when you're on Channel 17, everyone sees you all over the world. And I hear my, my good friend Tommy Rich just had a... A little run of good luck here. He became the world champion for a while. And I want to congratulate him on that and say that I am looking forward to coming back and having Tommy Rich as my partner and uh, taking up where I left off when I left here about two years ago. Well, I know, of course, you and Tommy were a very, very potent tag team combination, and that has to bring to mind, of course, the uh, the people right now who hold the Georgia Tag Team Championships, the Freebirds. Well, I know the Freebirds. They're no strangers to me. They get by with anything they want to get by with, and I'm going to tell you something. Freebirds, watch out for Rich and McDaniel, because I'm coming back, I'm coming to Georgia, I'm going to be in this area, and when I tell you I'm coming for a reason, get ready, because it's one thing, it's to win matches and win titles, and that's what I have a reputation for doing, and that's what I intend on doing. Well, certainly may we just take this opportunity to wish you continued success and looking forward to seeing you back here. Thank you, Gordon. I appreciate you very much. Chief Wahoo McDaniel, just a great guy and a great competitor. So Wahoo McDaniel back in the territory, looking forward to being back in Georgia here, gives congratulations to Tommy Rich about his recent world title win. And the Chief says the Freebirds, no strangers to Wahoo. And he looks forward to teaming up with Tommy and maybe helping him get some revenge against Michael Hayes and company. Yeah, but unfortunately, Wahoo doesn't really stay around very much. I mean, he'll he'll make the odd appearance here and there. So I'm guessing at this point he was still up in Mid-Atlantic at the time. I don't think we see him on TV again until later in the year. No, I don't think we get him on any house shows either. It just felt like maybe he was in town and it was like, hey, Wahoo, want to get your uh, face out there on uh, cable TV for the day? Sure, why not? Well, we're going to get to it. He does appear at a few house shows, three or okay. four, but but that's about it. All right, so Wahoo in town for a few days anyway. I got you. All right, we ain't got there yet, but he's back in town, and maybe maybe he'll team up with Tommy Rich. We'll have to wait and see. As, uh-oh, last week it was Brody invading the set repeatedly, but this week it is the strong man, Ken Patera, back for another one with Gordon. I want to take a moment right now to talk to Ken Patera, the world's strongest professional wrestler. Strong man, baby. Wahoo McDaniels. He's got to be the craziest Indian this side of the Mississippi. And Rahul, someday you'll meet the wrath of Ken Patera. Just like everybody else, it's going to get a turn. It's inevitable that I will rise above everybody else and be up on the pedestal. And everybody's going to be taking a shot at Ken Patera. But right now, I'm in the process of establishing Ken Patera. Everybody says, I understand that you are undoubtedly the world's strongest man, not only the strongest wrestler in the world today. Well, that's right, people. And next week, I'm going to start doing some feats of strength. Bending bars, bending spikes, driving spikes through boards, tearing license plates in half, telephone books, stopping pick 
pickup trucks with my legs. Everything is in the future, and the future belongs to Ken Patera. And don't ever forget that name. I'm from a family of winners. Everybody knows my brother Jack, the famous coach of the Seattle Seahawks, and two other brothers in the NFL. I have the most athletic family in the world going today. And who is the best in that family? You're looking at him, baby. You're looking at the man that won four gold medals in the Pan American Games, set 54 world records in weightlifting, went to the Olympic Games. I have done it all. And now I have been in professional wrestling eight and a half years now, and there's nothing, nothing is going to stop Ken Patera because I am the machine that is going to make everything tick around here. Well, one thing about Ken Patera is that uh, he's not afraid to tell you about himself, but uh, he backs it up as well. Let's turn it over to our ring announcer. Patera says next week we'll start his feats of strength here on television. Talking about coming from a family of winners, of course, Seahawks coach Jack Patera. He also has two other brothers in the NFL, says Kenny here. But Patera, Ken Patera, that is, the best of them all. Four gold medals in the Pan Ams, 54 weightlifting records in a trip to the Olympics. The guy was legit. And even if you hated him, you had to respect Patera. Everything about him was real. You have a lot of heels who talk the talk. Maybe they walk the walk in the wrestling ring, but that background, eh, it's subject. Eh, with Ken Patera, it's there. It's proof. The proof is there. 54 weightlifting records. Perhaps you watch the Olympics. You remember the name Ken Patera. Again, strongman competitions we've seen him in. Pan American Games. There's, there's ways to look this up. Even then, not the internet, but you can verify that Ken Patera, he had various records in weightlifting. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I never met Patera. But he was scheduled to be at Barry Rose's last Fan Fest last June and then had to pull out because he was having a back operation and he wasn't going to be able to fly. But I heard him touch on it, but I never got to hear the, the full story. You know, he was on the Olympic team in 72 when the Israeli, Israeli athletes were massacred. I always wanted to know what it was like from his perspective and what they were telling them at the time and, you know, just his whole experience of that. Yeah, Patera, you know, he's talking about gonna, he's going to start doing these feats of strength, and a lot of guys have done that gimmick over the course of time. But i got to be honest with you, nobody did it better than Patera. He was the only one I thoroughly enjoyed watching him do those, holding the van up against the wall, you know, while it's in, in drive and things like that. But just everything he did, it felt more real than it did with some of the other guys. Even if they were actually doing those feats of strength, the best, you can go, the best way you can go with it was watching Patera do those feats of strength. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be quite entertained with those feats of strength, especially when we get to the hot water bottle. I know I will be. That was always a good one as well, the water bottle gimmick. But we head back to the ring right now. Kim Patera in the ring once more, this time taking on Tom Yancey. And Patera going to score the easy win by submission. Now, anyone who never saw Patera in his prime, go watch this episode of TV. Go watch this match because he can move, move around the ring for a weightlifter if you will. And I put air quotes around weightlifter when I say that, but literally hopping up to the middle rope in that previous match earlier on the show, great hammerlock takeover here. Wrestling hold just flows into the moves naturally for a guy, his size, a guy, his build. Kenny takes the fight outside here in the match as well, slamming his opponent on the floor. Then a suplex back into the ring where he delivers multiple finishing moves and multiple times pulling his opponent up at the count of two, be careful. You got to get yourself disqualified there, Ken. But eventually it is this time the swinging neck breaker that's spinning full Nelson. Got to get the job done in just two minutes and 20 seconds. But impressive, the athlete that was Kim Patera, not just strong, but very agile earlier in his career as well. When you see him in 74, 75, up, up to about 78, he's much thicker. Right. And by this time, he has uh, slimmed down a lot, but he's still cut. And he could fly around the ring pretty well. I always wanted to see, because I'd see pictures of it in the magazines, I always wanted to see him against Ric Flair. And I never got to see a Flair-Patera match. Yeah, that would be a cool one. I wish there was a nice, big, long Flair-Patera match out there, 30 minutes or something like See what they could do. I, I know they've competed against each other. I can't think of a matchup off the top of my head. Did they work Japan? Is there something out there from, from one of the territories off the top of my head? I don't recall. But that's definitely no, I mean, a I, know, I, as well. I saw pictures of them working Mid Atlantic in like '79, which would make sense. You know, in the magazines, I saw the pictures, but right. I never, I've never seen an actual match. All right, 
Well, unfortunately, I, off the top of my head, I don't recall ever seeing the match myself. So maybe I'm going to go do a little digging. Maybe we can pop one up on YouTube and watch it together, Jamie, and just kind of comment on it. Uh, it would be fun. Yeah, that would be cool. If I can find one, we will get that done. But for now, we hear more from Kim Patera, again, bothering Gordon Sully just briefly here, talking about the curse, referring to his swinging neckbreaker as the curse here, Jamie. Nice little name for it. I don't recall him ever saying it again, but... No, never before, the, never again. I think he was just bored and creating shit out of his ass. And that's what Kim Patera did. That's what Kim Patera does, from what I can tell. So uh, we go on with the show. We get a VTR standing by from Jim Crockett Promotions. And the Mid-Atlantic Territory, it's Rich Landrum talking with the American Dream, baby. I'm talking about Dusty Rhodes. Wrestling fans on Sunday, May the 17th, you'll want to be in the Atlanta Omni to see the great card of live professional wrestling action. Most importantly, the Georgia Heavyweight Championship is on the line in a special tournament, plus $5,000 to the winner, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. Well, the money's in Pognos, and the, the Georgia title is uh, the, the most important thing going on right now for Dusty Rhodes, the American Dream. In lieu of things that's just happened, in lieu of the world situation evolving around the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance, Dusty Rhodes, his own record as chasing hard the world's title. And I feel this tournament is the biggest tournament in the history of Atlanta, whether they've been tag team tournaments, whatever kind of tournament they were, because it is a... I mean to the end. The end is the world's title shot. The Georgia title, I want the title. I want the money. I want it all, and I'm coming for it in Atlanta Omni. So there it was, Big Dust, basically talking all about that upcoming Omni event, as is everybody else, that Georgia heavyweight title. If you've got anything to add, please do. Only that that Georgia title is going to get him another shot at Harley Race. They've already have acknowledged a couple months ago about the last tangle in Tampa where he doesn't get any more NWA title shots. However, being the Georgia champion means they have to give him a title shot. So kind of getting around the rules a little bit here. Slide in the back door. There you go. A means to the end. And the end here for Dusty Rhodes obviously found a loophole to find his way back to that NWA World Heavyweight title. Only Dusty. That's why he is the American Dream, baby. That's got that right. So we go back to the studio. Remember, that was a VTR from Mid-Atlantic. So we're back here in Georgia. Gordon Soley now standing by with Ted DiBiase, guys, and fair warning, this is a bit of a lengthy promo, but a fun one as DiBiase talks about his return to the company. And yes, the music video edited out in the middle, so not quite as long as it would have been. Here's Ted DiBiase right now with Gordon Soley. The NWA Review Board is currently reviewing the pile driver with the possibility that this hold may be named illegal throughout the entire United States. It was all brought to a head when uh, Ted DiBiase was injured by the Freebirds when they used the pile driver not only on the concrete but in the ring as well. And Ted, of course, it was a long, long struggle to get back. That's right, Gordon, and uh, I think that everybody will agree with me or know that my sentiments on the feelings. I think that the, the hole should definitely be outlawed. Uh, I spent a long time recovering from an injury, and I think that you've got a, a videotape on, uh, on my recovery and, and what I went through to get back into shape and get back 100 percent i think we'll take a look at that again well we're going to in just a moment i might just point out of course that what we're going to be seeing in just a couple of moments is the actual incident as it occurred uh, with ted DiBiase at the hands of the Freebird, and then we're going to follow ted's uh, uh recovery process from the hospital uh, to his workout session and to the fact that he is now back uh 100 but uh, as we said of course the pile driver has been uh, named illegal in some states uh, at the discretion uh, of the various uh, individual wrestling promoters. However, uh, the National Wrestling Alliance is reviewing the situation now, and uh, hopefully we'll be having an answer forthcoming from them uh, regarding the status of the pile driver as a whole. But now let's go back in time and relive these moments with Ted DiBiase and the Freebirds. <laughs> Well, you can certainly tell by the folks here at the Television Sports Arena, Ted, that they're solidly on your side. Well, I, I really appreciate it, Gordon. You know, the, the fans have stood behind me all through this ordeal uh, that I went through, and uh, uh, any professional wrestler should know, and, and I certainly do know that without the fans, we wouldn't be here, and they, they play a very big part in my life because, like I said in, in the film that you saw, wrestling is my life. It's, it's been my way of life. Uh, uh, you said it, and a lot of people know it. My father died wrestling, and I think that's the one single thing that has made me be as determined to continue uh, in his footsteps 
as anything else. Uh, as a young boy, I felt like if I could follow that man and be as much like him as possible, and I, I would I would make my mark on the world. And I try to do it right there in that ring. Uh, sometimes I'm short of words, but I, I think that actions speak louder than words, and I try to save most of my talking for that ring. Uh, I will say this: there's a great deal of wrestling talent coming into the Georgia area. You've got just here today. You got Ken Patera. You got the return of Wahoo McDaniel's. You've got this great big Bruiser Brody. The Freebirds are still around. There's a lot of people coming to Georgia, and they're coming here because this is the hotbed of professional wrestling. This is where it's all happening. And like I said before, I want to be the best. Uh, I don't want to settle for anything less. Uh, I, no matter what it takes, no matter how long it takes, like I said before, I've never, ever been a quitter in my life. And uh, just like that film says, you know, I'm going to make it to the top. It may take a while, but, uh, you know, you, you, you find a lot of pitfalls. You stumble and fall along the way. But I feel like the better man is the man that can get up one more time than he falls down and keep going. And I've got that determination. And if I can keep these people in the studio and the people out there behind me and following me, then I'm certainly going to make it. Well, I can assure you of this, uh, Ted, that uh, we're all very proud of you and proud of your recovery, and uh, certainly we wish you continued success and perhaps one day eventually that goal that you're looking for. Gordon, thank you very much. Ted DiBiase. So there it is, DiBiase. He talks outlawing the pile driver in Georgia, perhaps, uh, which is currently under review, says Gordon Soley. We also revisit, via video footage, some of the DiBiase Freebird storyline, which is kind of fun to keep the story going here on TV, refresh for everyone. From the injury way back in time, the neck injury on DiBiase, the four pile drivers, to Ted's rehab. How can we forget that? And we even get that epic fame music video again here this week. And when he's done, DiBiase says with the Freebirds, he still has that goal. They kind of mention it here of that world heavyweight title, it would seem anyway. Yeah, because he'll be, after he does away with them, him and JYD will shake hands, go their own ways. And now it's time for Ted to move on on his own. I wanted to talk about this segment. How well packaged is this? Uh, first, it's Gordon Sully talking with Ted DiBiase. We go into video clips of the feud. We see the clips of the rehab. The whole story is being told here. The big fame video, DiBiase back from that uh, nearly career-ending injury. And then we hear from DiBiase one more time talking about that big revenge, no DQ match at the end of the segment. I think it was like three and a half minutes I played here of what was really maybe a, like an eight-minute segment. So quite a long time here to focus on just one man, DiBiase, the storyline, but I thought it was really well done. It was excellent. And once again, this is the influence of the Cowboy. You could tell that he's still basically in charge at this moment in time. He hasn't uh, turned things over to, to Ole or George Scott. At this moment in time, but I do believe it's this month, and I don't have the exact day on me and, and the notes here for this episode that we're doing, but it shouldn't be too long any time now. George Scott going to take over briefly before... It's given back to Ole Anderson there, I believe, like in another few weeks or months or whatever the case may be. Uh, so Ole Anderson is going to be back in charge for quite a while. The remainder of this year, that's for sure. Uh, but we're not there yet. So the Watt, Watt's kind of stepping down soon. Buck Roby going to be pulled back away, but not before not before he makes an appearance here on TV. I won't give you more spoilers on that one, but that's coming soon. As we close out this edition of Georgia Championship Wrestling, we've got one more matchup in the ring and it's going to be Ricky and Robert Gibson taking on the duo of Gypsy Joe and the French Angel. And the Gibsons do what they do best, moving fast, fast tags, fast action. Clearly easy to see who helped prep Robert Gibson for that run with Ricky Morton. I'm talking about elder brother Ricky Gibson here. The veteran heels, they proved to be competition for the Gibson brothers. Fun competitive TV match, I thought. We see the familiar double dropkick here on a Gypsy Joe. But his foot was on the ropes, and the match had to continue as the heels get over back on top in the action. But finally, it's Ricky Gibson applying the famous Gibson family leg lock on Gypsy Joe for the pin here, 6 minutes and 50 seconds. So elder brother Ricky Gibson played a big part in getting Robert ready for that spot in the Rock and Roll Express. I mean, the Gibson brothers at this point, if you didn't have the Freebirds on the top of the card, well, now Robert's been around a few years at this point. They could have definitely been tag champs. I could see them giving the belts to the Gibson brothers, though they're just really finding their way here in the Georgia territory. They certainly were capable of having really good matches. In fact, I could see, you know, the Gibsons on top, even though the Oats are the huge babies, I could have seen them trying to work a Gibsons versus Oats brothers, brothers versus brothers match down there in Columbus, Georgia. That would have been huge for that area. And they probably could have kept both teams' faces and it would have gotten over. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, they're not turning either one of those teams' heels, that's for sure. 
So, uh, yeah, that would have been pretty interesting seeing the Gibsons there on top and what they could have done with that. But obviously the Freebirds leaps and bounds above uh, the Gibsons and Robert Gibson even uh, now at this point. So the birds belong where they are, no doubt about it. I don't think you're going to argue with me about that. No, not at all. As we head into a commercial break, don't forget it, Jamie. You mentioned it already. I'm talking about Tush tonight at 11 p.m. Tomorrow night at 7. Yes, Tush, as in the Bill Tush Show. Sketch comedy hour at its finest. It was it was great stuff back in the day. I I would stay up and watch it. I was going to ask you, did you ever watch the show? I never got you know the oh, opportunity. Yeah. And, and, and then it repeated again. I want to say Sunday mornings. Well, here it's tomorrow night at seven. It repeats. So, but yeah, I'm sure the hours changed and things. But unfortunately, it was before my time. I never got to watch Bill Tush here on this uh, program of his on TBS. But very interesting. TBS coming up with uh, not just wrestling, but some other uh, some other TV programming that was all their own to a degree. Do you know what else TBS had? And it was syndicated because we got in Philadelphia for a little bit later. The Putt Putt Miniature Golf Tournament of Champions. Wow. Okay. Was on, that I never was saw. on like at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. They would go to different Putt you You know, the brand Putt Putt, not sure. Miniature Golf. The, right. the, the Putt Putt itself. And Putt Putt had courses all over the United States. And they would have tournaments, just like professional golf. They had their own tournaments at a different putt putt. Oh, very each cool. Week. Very and it cool. would be about an hour show, and it would be like the finals, the top, you know, couple people up against each other. That's awesome. I'm sure some people are smiling. You're uh, bringing back some memories for some people out there right now talking about that show. I wish I'd seen. It. I'm gonna have to go Google it, try to find it on YouTube or something, see if there's any other and, footage out there. You know, and I'm a teenager at this point, so you don't have a lot of stuff to do. And the putt putt was only you know, a two minute uh, walk from my house. So you're bored. You go to putt putt. And then they added an arcade that even made it better. Oh, of course. Arcade back in the early eighties. My God, you got your arcade. It's putt putt arcades, bowling, not and, a whole, like you said, not a whole lot to do, you know, back in and the day. Thursday was all you could play day for like $5. Wow. We'd go at 10 or 11 in the morning and then leave at 10 or 11 at night. How long did you they keep that 24 up? hours back then up for years. Oh, okay. I was going to say, how long did they keep that up before they realized, eh, maybe this isn't the, the best of ideas? Did they sell beer there? No, no not at the not at my pup hut they did. Uh, but my pup hut's still open. My wife and I, matter of fact, just went the other week. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, but you've, you've been able to do a lot of things so recently. I'm glad you've been enjoying money. yourself. Then you, then you get payback going back to work and then not feeling so well immediately after work. You get her right away. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, guys, don't forget to check it out. Tush, if you can, tonight at 11 p.m., says Gordon, so- or says Freddie Miller. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I didn't grab a soundbite of this. I, these, are, these are fun. You were talking about how you talked about these with John McAdam, but it's Freddie Miller back out here again, talking about the Georgia territory, heading to Lawrenceville tonight with the fabulous Freebirds. Also tonight, Georgia will be in Cincinnati, Ohio. At the Cincinnati Gardens, that caught me off guard a little bit, featuring Tommy Rich on that card. So talk about splitting up the talent here. The Birds are in Lawrenceville, Tommy Rich, and Cincy. I mean, without looking at it, maybe Tommy's appearing on a Mid-Atlantic show because it wasn't Mid-Atlantic bouncing off of Knoxville and Cincinnati around that time. <sighs> Man, I just, Cincinnati's just not really, head. yeah, Cincinnati's not really in that whole circle, though. So it just, it threw me off guard. I I know they've been doing but Columbus, remember, but Cincinnati now. So they're hitting another Ohio, a major Ohio yeah. city. I remember Mid Atlantic starting to run in Cincinnati. So that's what I'm kind of thinking here. It's a Mid Atlantic card. And Tommy Rich is appearing. Okay. Well, that would make sense since he's kind of at the Kentucky border and things of that nature. So it's, it's very possible. That was what was going on there, but Tommy Rich and I yeah, think, headlining the I, show. I, yeah. And I think what Flair Mulligan uh, are and Crockett, still um, running Knoxville at the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know when they pick up doing that, but they're going to do that through pretty much the end of the year, and then it just kind of wanes away. Right, and then Crockett opens up McGurk's territory, or tries to keep it alive, going through Paul Jones there at the end. Kind of. And the show here, you talk about Crockett, the show going to continue on here, Georgia. We're going to go back to another VTR from the Mid-Atlantic Territory, Rich Landrum standing by with the hammer, Greg Valentine. Atlanta wrestling fans, on May the 17th in the Omni, a tournament for the Georgia Heavyweight Championship, $5,000 to the winner, one of the entrants. They call him The Rock, Greg Valentine. That's right, I haven't been in Atlanta too many times, but no tournament could be complete without a superstar like myself, a professional wrestling Greg Valentine, the hammer. 
And everybody in Atlanta going to find out just why they call me the hammer. Especially when I tie up somebody's arm and crack him across the chest and they hear it all the way down in Macon, Georgia. $5,000 to a winner plus the Georgia heavyweight title. I've been the U.S. champion. I've been one half of the world tag team champion. I've got credentials a mile long. And I also understand there's a bounty on Wildfire Tommy Rich. I don't know who's putting it up, though, but $10,000. I'll tell you what, Wildfire, I'm going to make you a wallflower. You understand what I'm talking about? $10,000 a bounty. Well, there you have it, the comments from uh, Greg Valentine. Wildflower? Wallflower? I don't know what's going on here. Greg Valentine knows this is a bounty, but he doesn't know who put it up. Clearly hasn't been watching TBS. And then Rich Landstrom referring to him as The Rock, as Valentine then corrects him repeatedly that it's The Hammer. So lots of uh, weird things going on there in that promo. Yeah, you think they would have reshot that one, but... Then again, it wasn't for their show, so what did they care? Yeah, they didn't give a shit, obviously. Yeah, that's that's pretty obvious there. Rich Lanzer, he's seen Greg Valentine enough to know that he's the hammer, so maybe only on the other side of that camera he's looking at The Rock, and uh, maybe he's getting a little nervous or something. Maybe something went on there. But Greg Valentine was notorious for not giving a shit or knowing uh, when he was cutting these VTRs for, for other uh, promotions when he would come in. I remember one time when he was going to work Pez Watley coming into town, and he referred to him in the promo repeatedly as, as Pete Watley, Pete Watley, Pete Watley. And actually, they had uh, the following week when he cut another VTR, he had to correct himself and, and apologize. Like, oh, I was calling him Pete, but his name's really Pez from my understanding. It's like, wow, really? We got to do this. But Valentine, when he would do these sometimes, he would just kind of go into him, boom, I don't, I just give me the gist and uh, here we go. And it was just funny there. Uh, I, there's a bounty on Tommy Rich. I don't know who put it on him, but I guess there's a bounty and... The wildflower is going to be, you know, whatever, whatever he said. Yeah, see, always trying to squeeze his way back in at this point, so he he hasn't screw up the promo to begin with. If you want to go conspiracy theory, okay, well, I I could buy that. I could see Oli because doing that. they because they know they need to put a Valentine promo on TV. So if he screws it up, that makes Watts look bad instead of making uh, them look bad. And speaking of Oli, got to close out the show with. The Anderson Brothers. We're going to close it up. It's joined in progress, a VTR of a match involving Ole and Gene. The Anderson Brothers, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew, scoring a win over Tony Russo and Mike Davis, I believe that is. Bob Cottle and Lord Alfred Hayes on commentary for that one. What a bonus. Tony Russo is another one of my all-time favorite enhancement talents. Oh, mine too. I always thought he was good enough to get a a TV title uh, run somewhere. I think so. And I think, you know, if you look at him, maybe, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Tony Russo could really go. One of my favorites as well on the underneath. Yeah. And so was Mike Davis. And Davis had already, you know, got a minor push in Georgia before this. And he had to feud with the Andersons, if, if you remember, a couple of months ago. You know, every once in a while, I'll post something online of Alfred Hayes as a heel. And a lot of people are dumbfounded. They don't know him beyond his run with the WWF. And I get it because oh, he, was- he started, started back in 83, 84, something around that time. But and that's why I mentioned he's on commentary here. If you guys want to go check it out, this Anderson's match, total heel Hayes commentary here. Yeah, I first got to see him in Florida in 80 when I was getting, watching that stuff on the Satellite Program Network. And I had never heard about Alfred Hayes up to that point. I, I might have read, you know, the name in the magazines, but I loved his stuff in Florida. Very slow, deliberate, and to the point. Yeah, I was just watching some of his uh, feud with Jerry Briscoe down there in Florida. Some of the promos, really fun stuff by Alfred Hayes. Really great heel, underrated. Uh, I don't know why Vince never pulled the trigger. He had so many managers. You wonder why he never pulled that trigger on Alfred Hayes coming in, why he decided to make him just another guy. He became a comic relief, really, as part of the company. But it's kind of weird because Hayes had played a heel so well for so many years as a manager and as a wrestler prior to that long stint with the WWF. You know, when he first comes into the WWF, though, and he's doing, it was just like a stupid promo thing where he's sitting there sipping his tea. It was kind of heelish. So I'm wondering if they had plans for him right after the Grand Wizard died. They were going to bring him in. And then things just changed. Well, you know, maybe he was now. able, yeah, you know, maybe he was able to sign Piper and said, you know what, Lord, it's not going to work. I need to use this guy in this manner. And I'll just make you like a rural statesman. Well, and it worked pretty much well. Right. He, yeah. He got a nice long run into the up to at least nineteen ninety. He was still 95. doing that. Ninety five. Was he around that long? Under, okay. Yeah, under contract. Well, he was promotional consideration guy. That's for sure. Right. And any other jack of all trade they could use him for, Coliseum videos or what have you. So 
Alfred was there. They always found something for him to do until they did all those major budget cuts when they were really losing their ass. Yeah, a buddy of mine, Neil J. Shockett, who is from Baltimore, actually grew up around the corner from Lord Alfred Hayes. Uh, when Hayes first came into the WWF, he was oh, living in Baltimore. Cool. And he ran into him at the ball one day and and then started running into him at all different kind of places and actually became friends with him. And he oh. said that he, he was a really sweet man. That's what I hear about him, that he was a really sweet guy, a really fun guy. And he seemed funny, naturally funny, uh, given the uh, opportunity. So it's unfortunate we didn't get to see him utilized a little better that last decade or so of his career. Uh, but uh, we look at some results here as we head into the Omni. But first, it's uh, May the 16th. We knew they were going to Lawrenceville and Cincinnati on that day, but I don't have results for either. I'm assuming the Freebirds retained, obviously. Tommy Rich also likely scored a win there in the Cincinnati Gardens, both May the 16th at Lawrenceville show in Central High School. So the Birds working a high school instead of the Gardens in Cincy. Kind of an odd call. Well, again, that's part of my reasoning that that, that may have been a Mid Atlantic show. Oh, I see what you're because, saying. Because the Freebirds weren't sent there, and they only mentioned Tommy Rich. They very well could have been. But, I mean, they were running split shows, but we've seen Rich against the Birds all week, so it was just odd that he wouldn't be here. So that could be the uh, reasoning. You may have hit the nail on the head with that as we roll on. May the 17th, two more shows to discuss here. First, stopping in Chattanooga, Tennessee, earlier in the day at the Memorial Auditorium. Brian St. John over Bill Irwin. It's Iron Mike Sharp over the French Angel. Tommy Wright scoring a win over Gypsy Joe. Roberto Soto defeating Jim Duggan. And in the main event, six-man tag team action. Listen to this one. All three fabulous Freebirds. It's Gordy, Hayes, and Roberts defeating the team of the Junkyard Dog, Tommy Rich, and Robert Gibson. That one sounds fun. Yeah, it would have been. I mean, we know that Gibson had to do the honors of that one. But another interesting result there is Bill Irwin losing to Brian St. John. So if you were making the ride from Chattanooga to the Omni, you knew Irwin wasn't winning the Georgia that's what I was. That's what I, th- I thought you were go- getting at there. Yeah, you knew Bill Irwin probably wasn't going to go over in the tournament after watching him job to St. John here in the opener in Chattanooga. But uh, we roll on. Everybody gets in their cars, and they head down south, back to the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia. Also May the 17th, we have finally arrived to that Georgia heavyweight title tournament show. But first, non-title matches. Going to see Robert Gibson over Bryant St. John. It's Ricky Gibson defeating Gypsy Joe. Gypsy actually subbing for the French Angel in this one. We'll get to why in just a few minutes. So both Gibsons over successfully here in singles matches. Also on the card, Roberto Soto subbing for the National Heavyweight Champion. Remember we had one of those? Yes, Steve O. Roberto Soto here subbing for Steve O. Now last week on TV, or or, May the 2nd on TV, there was mention of Steve O participating in this show, but they've kind of slowly moved back on that because Bob Eaton picking up that win a couple weeks ago on TV, it was to set him up for a title shot here against Steve-O, but Steve-O stuck in Japan, nothing big, guys. He's on his way back. Should be back by the next TV, I believe. But Steve-O just doing a tour of the IWE in Japan, and he just didn't make it back in time. The tour finished up just uh, less than two days prior, and he just didn't make it back here in time like they planned. Roberto Soto instead subbing in, scoring a win here over Bobby Eaton. That's a shame. I miss Mr. Personality. Well, you won't have to wait too much longer for Steve O's return. But yeah, that's kind of weird. You give him the belt and immediately send him to Japan. And he's your top champion in the Georgia territory. And you can't even give him a spot with Baba or Inoki's company. Well, Baba's company, the NWA. But uh, it's just really weird that Steve O goes and works for the third tier level of the IWE. They're probably just trying to get him some seasoning by sending him over there. That way he'll be vastly improved when he returns. And there's a couple of fun matches I actually posted of Steve-O in this specific Japanese tour on my YouTube. If you guys want to go check those out, see what he was doing while he was away from television here in Georgia. But Steve-O, he will be back soon, but he misses this match. And unfortunately, Bobby Eaton misses that title opportunity of a lifetime. But bigger and better things are ahead for Bobby Eaton, so... Yeah, more opportunities ahead for the uh, beautiful Bobby, indeed. Also, one final match before we get to the tournament results. It's Ted DiBiase and the Junkyard Dog. They finally did it, Jamie, defeating the team of the Fabulous Freebirds in a no disqualification return match. No DQ, no time limit. The bird is the word uh, every week on TV, but unfortunately here tonight, it was the night of the dog and Ted DiBiase. I hope on TV next week we get to see some highlights of that match. Me too. That sounds like a fun one. No disqualification. Can't wait to see how that one worked out, or if we will. 
Uh, but then we move on to Georgia heavyweight title tournament action, and we get six first round matches. Kind of an odd way to set things up, but we'll see how it plays out. And in that first round, stop me if you hear anything here that catches your eye, Jamie. It's wildfire Tommy Rich over Bill Irwin. Ken Patera defeating Ray Candy. Ray Candy never even appearing on TV leading into this, but he does show up for the show. But he's a solid Georgia name, so you don't have to have Ray Candy on television ahead of time. Everybody in Georgia already knows who Ray Candy is. Right. But, uh, and I wonder how Patera won this match because I don't, I don't think it's physically possible to really get Candy. Yeah, in a I don't full think Nelson. so either. That's a big boy, Ray Candy, there to lock into the full Nelson hold. So yeah, I think it's some shenanigans went on there. Kenny Patera scoring a first round win over Ray Candy. Also in the first round, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, going to advance, scoring a win over the French Angel. French Angel yes. in here substituting for Mike Boyer. Remember Boyer, Mike Boyette, also known as. Uh, he was uh, originally announced and scheduled to be part of this, and seems like out of all of the names, he had no reason to no-show this event, so kind of odd. Maybe they told him, don't bother coming. I'm not really sure what the deal was, but Dusty Rhodes scoring a win over the French angel Frank Morell. Well, Boyer was known to be a little bit of a wild child, wasn't he? Well, that's in, true. In, in, in his personal life, so <laughs> it's possible he just completely no-showed. And Good to see good old Frank Morell getting a uh, title shot here, being invited to participate in the tournament. How long do you figure that match went? One, two, three minutes? Dusty Rhodes scoring a win here? Oh, at most. A couple, uh, you know, probably got a drop kick, whip into the ropes, drop kick. Drop kick? Oh, yeah. Dusty could throw a drop kick. I'm not he, questioning if he could throw a he drop kick. To. He's going to throw one on Frank Morell. Is he going to save that? Yeah, he's going to throw a little drop kick and then the bionic elbow and over. Ain't getting paid by the hour, baby. Dusty that's Rhodes right. will advance into the next round, as will. It's bad enough he has to work twice this night. Well, that's true. Well, you gave it away, the spoiler. You, now we know that he won't make it to the finals. Damn it, Jamie. You can't do that. But that's okay. Go back and edit, edit I'm not it editing out. that out. I, I, I want everybody to give you shit. That's all. Okay, that's fine. Uh, also advancing in the first round, Greg the Hammer Valentine in town, or Greg the Rock Valentine, if you listen to Rich Landrum. Valentine scoring a win over Mr. Wrestling 2. Where the hell's he been? He's been practicing being a manager somewhere. He must have been. because He's got, he's got his car to get on, working independent shows. You know, looking good at ringside. Leave two alone. Much like Ray Candy, clearly wrestling to uh, a very well-known name in Georgia and really just being brought in for this show for his name value to put somebody over in the right. first round. Also in the first round, Iron Mike Sharp scoring a win over Big Jim Duggan and Nikolai Volkov reportedly receiving a bye into the semifinals. Which See, really now there's something that, that hurts your tournament at the time. How do you put Duggan in the tournament when, not that he's, doing the jobs on TV, but he's a losing half of a tag team week after week. Was it just me, or wasn't Bruiser Brody originally announced for this tournament? If he was, it got by me. I, I don't remember him being announced for it, but it's very possible. Okay, I could have swore the first week when they were announcing the participants, Gordon Sully name dropped Brody, but maybe I'm mistaken. I very well could be. All right, we'll have to go back and check the tape. So six man, well, five matches and a bye. No explanation as to why Nikolai Volkov, who hasn't even been in the territory, somehow receiving a bye into the next round. But this is where things get interesting because it's the semifinals, but we have three matches. So it's kind of interesting to see how everything plays out here. It's Tommy Rich in the next round defeating the very fresh Nikolai Volkov. Remember, hired specifically as a bounty hunter for Michael Hayes to take Rich out. Well, that doesn't happen here, guys. Tommy Rich going to advance to the finals, defeating Nikolai Volkov. Also in the semifinals, Greg the Hammer Valentine scoring a win over Iron Mike Sharp. And the big match I was waiting for here in the semis, Dusty Rhodes, the American Dream, going to a double disqualification with Ken Patera. So both men eliminated, leaving only Tommy Rich and Greg Valentine. But you have to wonder what was going to happen there had Dusty or Patera advanced. It's almost like they, they knew this was going to happen. Probably they were going to do the coin flip gimmick if this was uh, legit. Ah, the coin flip gimmick. Yes. See who's going to wrestle potentially twice here. Uh, so right. we see the former NWA world champion, Tommy Rich, on one side. His opponent, Greg Valentine, wrestling for the NWA Georgia title. Now, Valentine, maybe he's going to go for that bounty, but if he doesn't know who put it up, how can he collect? I don't really know. I guess he's not going to have to worry about that because it is Tommy Rich scoring the win, winning that vacant NWA Georgia title formerly held by good buddy Tony Atlas, Tommy Rich pinning Greg the Hammer Valentine here in the finals of the tournament. Yeah, and Valentine's one and done, so it's not a big deal for him to lose out. 
No, and I think that's, you know, because it's a big win for Tommy Rich. I mean, now Harley Race, you're in his eyesight. As a Georgia fan, I think, you know, I'm wanting to see Ken Patera in there with Tommy Rich more than I want to see Greg Valentine. Now, wrestling wise, Valentine all the way. But Patera's sticking around, and I think that's why Patera doesn't make it to the finals. We don't want to job him out that quickly into his short tenure here with the company. Right, exactly. So this is where the changes are getting ready to occur. And I'm going to guess that the George Scott Ole Bill Watts is all conferring on this show on how, you know, to move forward. Yeah, and we're going to see how that plays out over the next couple of weeks of television as well, because clearly there's going to be a shift in the bookers. Bill Watts is going to step back, probably getting really overwhelmed with all of the, the money they're making over there in the Mid-South Territory. you got to stay focused. They're going to expand into more states, into that McGurk area as McGurk's getting ready to shut down permanently. Yeah, I was just about to say, isn't this around the time that Watts Ordered takes you. over the old tri-states? Right. So tri-state's not a whole lot left in them, maybe a few more months. But uh, in, in general, really, theoretically, they're just kind of on life support at this point as it is. And uh, guys like Jimmy Snooker, though, uh, traveling through there. Very weird uh, seeing some of the names that were still sticking around in that tri-state's region for McGurk here in 1981. Probably for various reasons, though. But uh, yeah, Watt's going to take over that area soon, and he's going to have the full Mid-South Uh, full-blown Mid-South region, and I guess, you know, just did not have the time to focus on Georgia at this point. Yeah, and again, it's easy to say, you know, 40-some years later, but just imagine if if they had decided to team together and go national, Watson Barnett, instead of always trying to do it himself. And they talk about bookers getting burned out, you know, every six months, every year, every whatever it may be. And then they're asked to step down, or maybe more than asked, forced to step down from their their position as Booker. I don't see that happening here. Watts hasn't been in control very long with Robley, uh, and it's been money, money, money since that that started. So I don't think it was Cowboy being asked to step down. I think it was Bill Watts probably going to somebody saying, guys, I got to finish. Kind of like Bruno would do with with Vince Sr., like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think Watts was kind of like, you know, it's time for me to, you know, go back to my own promotion and kind of focus on making my own money here. Like you said, it would have been great if they had partnered up, but unfortunately that doesn't happen. And we lose Bill Watts here any time now. It's a shame. I understand that um, Bill Watts isn't in the greatest mental state right now. Oh, okay. That That's would right. be an awesome question to ask him. It would have been. It definitely would have been. I wonder if he's asked that, you know, he's, he's done a few interviews throughout time. I wonder if that was ever touched upon. A lot of people only want to focus on the big things that we kind of already know about. But it's things like that that I, I really want to know more about. And unfortunately, I, did, I remember you mentioning that about Watts in the past. And that escaped me until you brought it back up again. That's really, really bad. Uh, you know, it's terrible to hear, especially with all of the recent passings as well in the, in the world. Right. Of yeah, I just I just read it within the last couple of months. I don't know if it was in The Observer or somewhere else, but I had heard his mental state isn't the, the best right now. And his overall health isn't exactly the best either. Oh, So I guess we'll never find out some of those answers. Yeah, that's, that's really unfortunate because Watts was a strong man, strong-willed man, a very intelligent man to know that maybe his mind isn't what it was. That's really sad to hear when somebody was so well-spoken, even for a Southern Oklahoma kind of gimmick guy, if you know what I mean. He yeah. was still well spoken for you know what he 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 knew man he was kind of like my grandfather who was also a southerner he was a Kentucky boy even though maybe the words came out maybe not proper at times he was very well street smart if you will very educated on life yeah I mean that's what made Mid South wrestling for me when I started get, getting the tapes and and even before that when I was watching Mid South on the uh, satellite program network when he would be the guest announcer and just the way he would tell a story. It just captivated me and, you know, sucked me in. And that was like some of the first wrestling I had seen outside of WWF at that time. Yeah, always a good time when the Cowboys involved. Unfortunately, like I said, he's moving on. We're going to get a little George Scott here for the short term before it's back to Ole Anderson, guys. We'll let you decide along with us when that exactly goes down. But for now, Jamie, we're going to wrap it up here this week. We talked about two more weeks of television. We looked at that big Omni card featuring that return match with the dog. DiBiase and the birds, the good guys finally getting a little revenge there. We'll have to wait and see if there's any repercussions or not. Also, new Georgia champion crowned and the wildfire Tommy Rich. So a consolation prize after winning that NWA world title. But uh, we're going to wait and see what happens moving forward. Lots of new talent coming into the territory. Yeah, it's so exciting times. Even though the Cowboy will be leaving, there's a lot of talent going to be coming in. And we have a lot of material to take this podcast for many years to come. 
Yeah, there's a lot of things going on in the background right now in Georgia. And with the talent coming in mixed with some of the guys that are already there, you really can't screw up too much at this point in time in the territory. So I, I'm looking forward to everything that's coming. I know some of it, some of it I probably forgotten over time. So I can't wait to get there with you, Jamie. Yeah, and we're not far away from when I, like I said, I started back in March going over to my friend's house most Saturday nights and, and catching the show. But we're only about five, six weeks away from me watching it every Saturday night live. Not live because it was recorded in the morning, but as it aired. And I'm sure it's, the memories are just going to keep getting triggered well, as it, I rewatch those shows. Well, it was live to tape, to be fair. So it was kind of like watching it live. It was good times. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And I know there's some big things coming here for Michael Hayes over the summer months that I'm, I'm sure you're looking forward to as well. Oh, absolutely. If you think I love heal Michael Hayes, wait till we get to the next chapter of Michael Hayes. Oh, man. I can't wait for that, guys, and I'm sure you guys can't either. But, Jamie, I want to thank you again so much for putting up with my coughs that nobody heard. Hopefully hopefully, I edited them all out nice and good throughout this uh, show here. But I just want to appreciate you putting up with me and uh, putting a show out, even though I don't sound the best. Well, you put up with all my ums the entire show, so we're even now. Well, that's fine. Not a whole lot of ums. I think you really well spoken here this week, kind of really flowing. I, I like the show, even though it wasn't the, the best of situations, at least on my end. Yeah, well, we've been trying to do this, what, for a couple weeks now, where I had a little window where I could do right. it, and then you couldn't do it, I couldn't do it, you couldn't do it, I couldn't do it, and now we finally got to a point where I'm just, we can finally get together again. I'm just happy to talk to you, man, and to get the show in as we move on with more May here in Georgia Championship Wrestling. The summer is upon us in 1981. It's going to be a fun ride, guys. And Jamie, just one more time, thank you so much for being here this week. Uh, it's my pleasure, and it... It's been great, even though I haven't been able to speak to you, listening to you and Roman do the uh, 1987 UWF, or 1986 UWF. Oh, yeah, and the Crockett Cup. Those Crockett Cup shows are great. Oh, it was a fun time. Fun time doing the Crockett Cup with Roman. It's always a good time doing a show with you or Roman, guys. And, uh, Jamie, you got anybody you want to shout out here before we close out the show? Yeah, I give a nice uh, shout out to my boys over at the Other Ship Podcast, Michael Herrick, Chris Spiker, Drew Samuels, and William Merriweather. They're a wrestling podcast, but they talk a lot of other topics. Just the other week, they had an awesome show on underrated sports movies. And I believe it was Michael Herrick had the, would have the same one that I would have as number one, Eight Men Out, about the uh, 1919 uh, uh, Black Sox scandal. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I saw that once upon a time, but just once. I, I need to go back and find that again. I wonder if that's streaming anywhere. Oh, uh, you could find that w- without a doubt. Plus, it's on TBS all the time or Fox. It, it seems like it's constantly on, but that's one of my favorite sports movies of all time. But, yeah, if you get a chance, check out the guys on the other ship. Uh, I'll actually be joining them in a couple of weeks where we're going to review the 1989 Halloween Havoc, which I attended personally and uh, watched most of the show from the stage of the Philadelphia Spectrum that night. Ah, uh, yes, so, Halloween Havoc, or as uh, the Z-Man would have called it that year, Halloween Havoc. Uh, yes. Repeatedly. This is the Z-Man here. It's Halloween Havoc. Halloween Havoc. Halloween Havoc 89. From Halloween Havoc 89. Somebody's- but yeah, so I'll be on with those guys again. And uh, it's definitely a podcast you guys should check out. Yeah, looking forward to uh, wait. I can't wait for that one. So I covered that on my Grenade Show a long time ago. It's been quite a while. So I'm looking forward to hearing that one. And uh, yeah, the guys of the other ship, just really good guys in general. So give this show a try. Quality people, really. And Jamie, you really find good people to be around, and I really appreciate you bringing me into that circle. Sometimes you trip into things, and I tripped into these guys, you know, basically through the uh, the Barry Rouge, Jeff Baldwin, and the entire, um, you know, Brian Glass wing. And it, it's been a blast for me. I've gotten away from wrestling for a long time, then have gotten back into it, and now I'm even doing a podcast with you. So a lot of great people out there. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up here this week. We have a lot of fun here, too, Jamie, and we're going to be back soon. More regional wrestling on the way. Once again, thank you, Jamie Ward. Uh, My pleasure, and I'll see you soon, Ray. All right, and that's going to wrap it up here this week. But the territory talk will roll on. Jamie Ward going to be back soon. Going to talk a little more Georgia 81 here in the month of May. Also, Roman Gomez is going to be back very shortly with more 1986 in the UWF. Lots of big things coming there as well. Of course, I am your host, Ray Russell. You can follow me on Twitter at Rasslin Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. I want to thank you guys again, and we'll be back soon with more regional wrestling where we 
Talk the Territories. 